All right. I'll call the meeting to order. I think. Just on you. That's not how you do it. I know. I know. Are we good, Mr. Gilberto? All right, folks, we're calling the meeting to order. In accordance with the open meeting law, the board states for the record this meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. We are recording by Zoom. The town is also recording by Zoom. If, if you could please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we are to our first order of business, which is to introduce our new Director of Elder Services in the Senior Center. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. You. Roberto. I'm pleased to welcome uh, Kim Manzelli, who's here uh, this evening, who is our new Director of Elder Services and Director of the Senior Center. Kim, um, please stand so everyone can <laughs> Everyone who's joining us can see. I don't know if they can see you, but. Um, yep. You got her uh, on camera there? All right, great. Thanks, yeah. Paul. You don't just stand, just to wave, I yeah. guess. <laughs> Um, Kim is a familiar face uh, to many of us. Uh, mm -hmm. She is a former Council on Aging member uh, and also a resident uh, here uh, of the town. Um, she served on the Council on Aging up until, I believe, 2021 um, uh, for uh, a few years. Um, it was also uh, active in our pursuing our yes. designation as an age-friendly community um, in the 2018-19 time timeframe. Um, she is a registered nurse, although her, her responsibilities don't require her to be one, but she has a nursing background and um, was uh, initially involved with um, a care at an assisted living facility uh, in Reading, uh, which was uh, bought by a third party. And then uh, she was, her responsibilities were increased to multiple properties uh, owned by the PVD properties um, for, um, for overseeing um, services provided at those locations. So we're really excited um, to have Kim here um, uh, in this role. Um, you know, moving forward, you know, we had said going back a number of months, um, almost a year, maybe exactly a year, uh, that we were seeking to hire the Director of Public Services, which we have, um, Ms. Hartman is here, as everyone knows. Um, and so uh, there was an interview um, process that was conducted, um, led by Lillian, assisted by um, Dan Greenberg of the Council on Aging, and um, if Lillian, am I missing anybody from that group? Uh, I believe you have Catherine McCabe Scott, Catherine, Council on Aging, and Catherine McCabe Scott. Resources. Excellent. Excellent, thank you. So we had- And Sharon Kelleher from the library. Yes, that's right, thank you. I knew there was somebody that I wasn't thinking. Um, so uh, we're pleased to have gone through that process, and we certainly want to thank the community for its patience as we've gone through that process. Um, but uh, before I conclude my comments, I do want to recognize Sherry, who's here this evening. Um, Sherry and Susan um, kept the place going for us um, beginning in January when um, Ms. Prey retired, um, you know, making it available. And unfortunately, it took a while for people to realize that it was still open, that it was open and that services were being provided. But they did a fantastic job of providing services and, and a place for folks to go in a really difficult time uh, mm -hmm. because I think things were very straightforward during the thick of COVID because everything was closed. It was sort of the reopening that was more challenging, as I think we all know. Um, for all of us to some extent. Um, and they, they really did a fantastic job of balancing things and providing services um, for the community, uh, reaching out to folks by phone if necessary. Um, so I wanna thank Sherry. Susan could not be with us this evening. She had another obligation, uh, but I'll make sure that I catch up with her uh, tomorrow. Um, but uh, Sherry, we have some flowers for you that I'd like to give you just to say thank you. And Concludes my parent my uh, comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very well, welcome, Kim. Thank you, Sherry. And I don't know if anyone else has any comments. Sure. Good, Mr. Mr. Yeah, Mr. no. It's welcome and again. We look forward to uh, all your new ideas and expanding programming and telling us what we need to do as far as the senior center. We know we need to uh, expand the facility. Never mind the programming. Uh, <laughs> but some new fresh ideas are great, and you know, Sherry and Sue. Extremely grateful for all that you did to hold this thing together for us. And uh, you're fortunate. 
You've got great people around you. You've got a lot of support here. Um, all of us in the community as a whole, we're grateful for you being here. We're grateful for the people we have here and uh, wish you nothing but success. And your inaugural address yesterday was terrific. <laughs> she, she's on the job six days and she's all right, up front and center, give a speech. You know, the, the senior dinner was quite wonderful. She did a great job. Anybody else? I, I would just like to say, you know, Jerry and Sue did an amazing job and can't thank you guys enough the way you did through all of that. And Tim, I know you're going to be great and you have a fabulous team with you. So it's all good. It's all, all up from here. Yeah, I was going to say, so Kim, we started working together as a SAT back in 2012. Then we did NRSAT. Then we did ACT. Um, these are all leading up to the H Friendly initiative that we've done together. So, Kim, I can't think of anybody else better to be sitting in that seat than you. I'm really glad you came back into the fold again because we missed you over the last year or so when you were busy. So, welcome. Uh, you know, obviously we will be talking tomorrow. So, um, look forward to it. And Sherry, thank you very much for what you did and all the staff there and oh kept everything going. And, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the town's eyes are watching what happens here because it's really a big deal. Got to shift gears and go to a new level, and uh, can't have a better team than you have right now to make that happen. So nice to see you again. Look forward to working with you. All right. Uh, do you have anything else? What's yeah? Welcome. Okay. Um, you know, you're not new here. Welcome. And we look forward to we look forward to changes and upgrades. Like Thank you. Very excited to join the team. It's been fortunate to have the great support and the strong team, which is great. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you. Hey, don't feel compelled to spend the entire evening with us. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> Get out while you can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next order of business is to review the proposed MBTA Communities Action Plan. Madam Chair, to you while the town planner is approaching, um, I think please approach. <laughs> I think that I think the news is a, a bit more encouraging for us than it was the last time we were here, based on the reports I've heard from the planner and from the planning commission, um, and I'm sure you probably have experienced in your uh, your day your day role as well. Um, you know, we are I think sort of uniquely positioned because of the foresight of so many before us and the development that's taken place already in town and the in the, uh, the dense development over on the Wilmington town line. Um, I want the Planner, tell us some more, but I think we do have a potential plan moving forward, which is good because the consequences are actually more dire than initially recognized for not complying with the um, MBTA community's uh, action plan. Uh, but I think we're well positioned. All right, so we're joined by our planner, Mrs. McKnight, who, if for anyone that's joining us, this is not an overnight thing. The planner has actually been looking at this, studying this, working on this, revising it, looking at it again for a long, long time over a year now, right, Danielle? Probably yes. even before that. So uh, no, yes. <laughs> and Danielle has already addressed this at a number of meetings for us, discussing it publicly at these meetings. So this is uh, not a new topic that we've talked about, and we look forward to hearing what you have this time around. Thank you. Um, you should have in the information in your packets um, a memo describing the action plan as well as a draft um, of the action plan along with the questions that have been asked. Um, so if there are any questions about that, certainly uh, feel free to ask me, but I will uh, give a quick summary of what we put in there. Um, so the CPC has been discussing the requirements uh, for the new MBTA community's uh, multifamily housing mandate, and we're recommending um, targeting 100 and 104 Lowell Road as our compliant district. Um, these two properties already have a high concentration of multifamily housing, and they already do have the benefit of by right multifamily zoning. Um, we anticipate that the only change that would be needed to the zoning uh, for these properties would be to remove the special permit requirement that's associated with site plan review uh, for these properties. The next requirement in this process would be for towns to submit um, an action plan to the state uh, telling them how we believe we will comply. And so we have prepared this action plan um, identifying these properties as our target area for an eligible district. 
This action plan isn't binding. Um, the strategy can certainly be changed, um, but we do need to submit an action plan by January 31st in order to stay compliant with this program and to not lose our ability to receive certain state funds. So we certainly can submit our action plan by the deadline and change strategy if we find that we need to do that. To review, uh, we must have a district that allows multifamily housing by right. It cannot require a special permit. It must be at least 50 acres total, cannot be town-owned land, and it may not restrict age, unit size, or bedroom capacity in the zoning. The project can restrict it, but the zoning can't restrict it. 100 and 104 Lowell Road are already affected by the multifamily residential zoning district, which was put in place in 2017 in order to enable the Martins Landing development. And these uh, two properties, as you can see on this slide, they, they do meet the criteria for uh, the type of housing that they have, uh, but by the type of zoning that they have that allows housing, multifamily housing by right. Um, and the, it's, the area is 98 acres, um, cannot be town owned, um, and uh, the zoning does not restrict age, unit size, or bedroom capacity, even though um, at least one of, one of the individual projects does. The multifamily residential overlay district um, does comply, um, except for that requirement that um, is townwide, um, where site plan review requires a special permit. Um, a more traditional site plan review process without a special permit required would still be allowed. The district would be uh, these two properties only, since all of the surrounding land in the multifamily residential overlay district um, is, is town owned and would not fall. And this is just a breakdown of uh, the properties that are that comprise the multifamily residential zone district. Previously, um, we had been concerned that already developed land would not count, which is why we had not really focused in on these properties exclusively. Um, however, as the state continues to release information and guidance about this program, we understand that land counts whether it's developed or not. And we are supposed to look at land as though it, we would assume that it could be raised and redeveloped. While some area from within 100 and 104 Lowell Road could be eliminated because it's not developable, um, for example, it has wetlands on it, um, the property has 98 acres and should have ample space to meet the requirements. The properties would be subject to the multifamily residential overlay as they are now, um, using the dimensional requirements of the underlying industrial office zoning also, um, which they are subject to now. And those limitations are 60 feet in height, four feet in stories, and 50% of a maximum building area. The state is set to release a compliance tool soon, which will take us very specifically through an analysis of our chosen area and confirm whether it applies. Without this tool, I can't say with total certainty that it will comply. However, based on the best of our understanding of all the information that has been released to date, we believe this area will be eligible and with, with the zoning change that we discussed. It is our recommendation to go ahead with submittal of the action plan so that we remain compliant with the program. With the more detailed analysis, public hearings, and zoning change to come later in the year once the compliance tool is available to us. Um, while the CPC recommends this approach, we recognize that we've been preparing this action plan on behalf of the town, which is why we wanted to discuss it with the select board prior to submitting it. Um, the board doesn't need to take any specific action, but if your consensus is that the CPC should go ahead and submit the action plan as it's written or with any changes, we will make sure to do that by the January 31st deadline. I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Dickman. Questions, comments, queries? Mr. Walner. Just a quick question. Um, as a reminder for people listening in, too, what's the reward for, for satisfying the mandate? Like, what did the town get? Um, we do water, not lose. Water, right. yeah. It's not a reward. <laughs> it's actually so it's a mandate. Yeah. So we don't lose uh, the ability to get MassWorks funding. We don't lose uh, the ability to take advantage of other state grants, still possibly to be determined. It's DHCD is given dis discretion to basically um, prioritize communities that meet this mandate as opposed to communities that don't. Mm -hmm. And Communities have been discovering that um, while it wasn't explicitly explained when the legislation was first discussed and, and you know passed, um, a large a large number of communities have a very significant component of their housing authority funding coming from the the casino gaming funds, which a lot of communities didn't know. 
And so at least one community has been discovering recently that they have a huge loss to their housing authority budget because of that, um, because of not being compliant. So I, I think we know about most of the really big risks, but I, I don't think that people even really end there. I think that there will continue to be state grant programs, um, more and more of them added to that list of possible risks of loss of funding. So that's really something you wanna be really careful about. Thank you. Anything, anyone else, Mr. O'Leary? Just as far as this whole compliance thing with this MBTA community, um, what's our bogey? How many units do we have to commit to in order to be in compliance? Uh, zero. <laughs> so what we have to have a minimum of capacity of 750 units in our chosen district. Now we actually know that our chosen district um, has at least ha has at least that capacity because it's already been permitted for over 900 units um, in the form of you know the Pulte and the Martins Land uh, and the um, Edgewood developments. So there's no production requirement. We don't actually have to produce any new housing. Um, it happens to be that because of the way this property is zoned, um, and because of the way this property is zoned, that there has already been quite a bit of housing developed there. So there's no requirement for units to be created. Um, it just has to be zoned that way. So it's possible that going forward, if Martin's Landing wanted to come in to ask for more units on that property, um, if Edgewood decided that they wanted to reconfigure things um, and, and ask to put in more units, it, it, the zoning currently does say that it's by right zoning, they can have multifamily subject to site plan review. So it's a, it, the, the change that's happening here is really in the removal of the special permit requirement. It's not really a change in um, the use that it's zoned for currently. So we're fairly confident that we can basically say what we've already done will put us in compliance if we just change the zoning on and remove the special permitting? That's all this program requires. Doesn't seem as though it's very productive. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah. You so know, it doesn't seem like, and again, the initial feel that we got, and I'm glad you looked more deeply into it because, again, um, there's no way we could come into compliance if we had to come up with another 100, 750 no. units um, to, without sewerage. Um, there's no way we could come into compliance. And again, we were set up to fail. Uh, right. But the MBTA system that isn't functioning very well anyway. But, Aside Besides that. that. So, 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 so. <laughs> but, but I find it hard to, to believe, and again, I'm, I'm maybe a little skeptical, uh, that the state is going to give us a blessing on this for something that all we're going to do is remove a special permitting requirement on some housing that's already built. Uh, it doesn't it's answer just, the it's housing just stuff. making it a district that allows for that housing right. by, without having to, so well, it can be already developed and nev there, nothing ever come of it. There isn't much left no, to, but, to develop. That's no, but it's just yeah. changing it so that the, it's by right. That's all that, that and be, oh, when understand. the regs came in, it didn't allow for that. With it, you had to pick another place, but they've since modified Right. That. So we, we're lucky to have that. And there are towns that don't have that and are going to suffer from it and we would if we didn't have it so okay i'm just a little i had this nervous twitch here <laughs> and i had this nervous twitch developing seems too easy <laughs> so it's uh, uh and, and again, I, I, yes move forward if this is what it does for us right. yes move forward absolutely and i have this nervous twitch kind of developing yeah. that, uh, it's funny that because they're going to ch they'll change the laws again yeah. and again and they'll change their rules and they'll change their regs and they'll modify their regs and i think that's what mrs mcknight is saying it the, the way it's worded they could just decide possibly decide any right. kind of funding chapter 90 you're no longer eligible and we rely on that because we don't have enough revenue coming in we rely on that I know, you know, to do the things I, that again, we need to do. I'm just concerned that yes, yeah. this isn't going to come to fruition. But again, if this gets us <laughs> We're gonna we need think to be positive. right now, yeah. Yeah. Positive. I encourage the, the planning commission yeah. to move forward with the application. Yeah. All right. Well, yes. <laughs> let's hear from Mr. Studo, and then we'll, we'll figure out what we need to do for you. I will piggyback on Mr. O'Leary and just saying that it just, we don't want to give the perception even though maybe we now become compliant 
that by doing this, we're somehow going to get to certain residential uh, housing goals because I feel that some are already grasping at this development as you see what we can do, we don't need to change the town. So I just want to be very clear that this doesn't become one of those things where all of a sudden the CPC is put in the line of fire that, well, the CPC said that, you know, now that we have this great MBTA plan that we can just, you know, we can just do housing all over the place without changing the makeup of the town at all. So I just, you know, that, that's my, my concern because it's already happened in a previous meeting with members of the finance committee where they use this presentation to say that this was, you know, where I agree with Mr. O'Leary, I don't see how, if this is the way we need to be compliant, yes, but I don't see how this is going to bring us any closer to what the spirit of the actual MBTA community, what they're trying to accomplish. That's all I'm trying to say. And I, I mean, I think the whole philosophy behind it is obviously housing production, housing development, and, and multifamily housing, and, and I, I mean, there's, there's other tenants that have to be, there's other requirements that, that were studied and looked at, and that's why this prob you probably zoned in on this, because it met the other, right, re re other requirements. This wasn't just the only thing where it's probably a mile and a half, or it was within a distance of another so actually, rail or... we don't need, because we have no MBTA facilities within our borders, we don't have to meet that requirement that it's within a half a mile because we don't have any land area like that. I think the reason that a lot of communities are struggling really hard to meet this is when you have an MBTA facility, your housing has to go around that area, or most of it does. Because we don't, we are not tied to that. Um, other, I mean, you know, imagine if we had an MBTA stop or a station or something, on Main Street, we would now have to figure out how to rezone 50 acres, which is a lot. And we have this area that happens to be huge that we chose for multifamily housing a long time ago that it is very fortunate that we have it. Um, so I think that that's one of the reasons why it's, it's become, we're finding that it is a lot easier for us to be compliant. Now, I will say that once the compliance tool is released and we go through the whole exercise and we analyze and we spit it, you know, type in our zoning and we upload our maps and we get a result spit out and you know we may find that we have to do make further changes and adjustments um, I can't guarantee that because I haven't seen the compliance tool but from everything that we know this does seem to be the easiest course of action and the state has also offered to take our um, application and review it before we actually submit it not the action plan but when we're finally ready to go to town meeting for a zoning change they will review it and ensure us that we would be compliant given the zoning change before we go ahead and take any you know, full action at a town meeting. So. I, I had two questions, but I don't, are my colleagues all set? That was one of my questions because when I last reviewed these, even though we were, a, you know, I don't want to say primary, secondary, but community with services versus a neighboring community, I forget what our designate, we have a specific designation. It's, it read to me like we had to pick an area that was within a certain amount of miles from even a neighboring communities, like commuter stop or something. And um, so we don't have to do that now? We don't have to do that. It does happen by coincidence that this area is as close as you can get to our nearest yeah. station in Wilmington. So if we had to comply with that, this area actually would, but, but we actually don't have to with that anymore. We have to have the zoning district, but it does not have to be within any distance. They want us to choose somewhere suitable. That makes sense. Right. They want us to pick somewhere, you know, it, to, to have picked this as a large area with a lot of multifamily housing in it a long time ago does kind of, um, you know, speak to its suitability for, for that use. So, And then my second question to you is, again, when I last heard it, we could do an overlay? Yes. Is that what you're proposing that we do in that area, or just change it all together so that that's a new, just a plain old, by right, no permit, no overlay? So there is already an overlay on that district, and I think the easiest thing, what I would recommend that we do is for that overlay district, which is called the multi-family residential overlay district, just remove the requirement that site plan review have a special permit 
and we would need to come up with another set of site plan review requirements and regulations for that district only. That would be my recommendation, but we could do another overlay that those properties are subject to a few overlays already, at least three of them. <laughs> so I think we should try to change the provisions of the overlay that's already in that's existing. Okay. All right. Just in specific <laughs> to these sites, is there any more acreages, acreage that is developable? I, I think so. Yeah, I, I think that there because is. Because the developers, as they came forward with their proposal, can pretty much maximize their ability to take advantage of what they had for land. So, realistically, is there more room? There might be. I'm not really sure. Okay. And, uh, you know, they have, <laughs> it depends. I think it also depends if it, this, these properties are ever um, connected to a sewer or if they have to continue with their treatment plant the way the plants the way they are. Um, <clears throat> there are other factors that would go into whether these properties would be developable, but as of now, I mean, there really is nothing to stop Martin's Landing or Edgewood from coming to us with a development proposal saying they want to expand their areas. Um, they could. Um, even if the answer is no, there's absolutely nowhere left, we already know that there's capacity for at least 750 units there. So in my opinion, the way I'm interpreting this, we're already meeting what they say we need to meet. That doesn't mean that the CPC is not going to continue looking for other areas to develop and other opportunities for housing. Um, but I think in the interest of meeting this particular mandate, I, I think that these properties will, will, will do that for us. Well, again, I, I think the legislation as it was passed was a, I don't know how it went under the radar screen, but I think it caught communities like ours by surprise. <laughs> and um, it doesn't appear as though it's as dire as we thought it was going to be, right. which is good. But again, I still have this nervous twitch developer that you know, things can change. So but so I thank you for your effort. And, um, I, for one, say, yeah, move forward. Mrs. Gonzalez? So I followed, I followed this pretty closely, and I sat in on the last Zoom meeting that they had, which it's just kind of changed. It, it, it did sound very dire in the beginning. Um, but it's changed a lot, and basically the stars aligned for us on this one so far. So, yeah, I say go for it. We're lucky. We're lucking out on this one. I think one of the reasons that we felt that it, we, we were all panicking a bit at the beginning is because they had not actually clarified right. that it doesn't matter if there's development on the property. Right. Once they announced that, that you know, yeah. cleared up a lot for us. I remember the last time you were here, we were addressing the comment period and you had written out a whole list of comments. And I think when it first passed and they had that comment period, a number of communities did that. Many communities wrote in and said, you know, we've already developed around our station or our yeah. rail or our, you know, we've already had this multifamily housing area. Or, you know, it's unfair to not allow us when we've already sort of gone along with your philosophy of providing that, you know, that we, we've already developed it so it's unfair to make us pick vacant land, especially communities that don't have, like ours, that, do, that aren't like ours, that have open space to develop. But I remember that was one of the last things that we talked to you about. Obviously, I think the abundance of comments by communities that really had a similar complaint, maybe that's what, the, maybe they actually paid attention to that. Mm. But, so, in terms of what we need to do for you, we need to give you direction to take back to the CPC in terms of applying. I think if there's a consensus that it's okay for the CPC to go ahead and submit that action plan that I provided the draft of, mm -hmm. um, then, then we will go ahead and do that. So and let's see, let me just pull up the members. Mr. O'Leary, you're on board. Mr. Yes, Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez, mm -hmm. Mr. Sudo. You have your consensus, the unanimous. Thank you. Great work. Thank yeah, you. Thanks to the thank CPC you. for being right on top this. of that. Spending a lot of time on this, Bob. Yes. You're welcome. I certainly hope once we go through the whole process that we uh, find yeah. that the news is as good as we mm -hmm. believe it to be. So, <laughs> thank you. Keep us posted, please. Thanks. Thank you. All right. All right. Our next tears. order. That brought you into tears. Wow. All right, next order of business is public comment. Do we have anyone? Please, please, if you could come to the podium and state your name. 
Good evening. My name is Adam Austin. Live at 42 Main. <clears throat> uh, my comment is regarding the upcoming sewer project or wastewater project. I know that a lot of things are changing and we won't be having the, the vote on December 5th as we expected. But on several occasions, I've asked for access to the data uh, used to come up with some of the basic figures in the proposal. Uh, I know that we spend a lot of money. We spent a few million dollars or near that in, in having a study done. We haven't seen the, the study yet. It hasn't been published, I understand. But I have been told that I could access the data, that the public could access the data so that we could analyze the project. On four or five different occasions, I've asked for the data. I've been told to send email to the uh, wastewater, the public works wastewater email address. I've sent that on, on several occasions and have not received a response. And I'd like for some sort of an update on when the public can have access to the data uh, related to the upcoming wastewater project. Okay. I don't know if you so, have Mr. Gilberto. Sure. I, so, I, do, I do recall you sent us emails as well. Yes. Before yes. you sent them. Yes. Um, so the short answer is we, we do have a wastewater working group meeting. It's not a public meeting. Uh, but it's a meeting with the staff, the planning staff, and the finance staff tomorrow morning, where our intention is to discuss your most recent uh, request. Um, I think I think our concern is, again, as we've expressed to you, trying to balance the issue of the privacy that goes along with the individual water usage um, in the context of a larger document. Um, there are public documents that relate to water usage that get asked for as part of a closing for a sale. Uh, but to have it centralized in one spot, being readily available, we're trying to figure out how to manage that. And I think that we've made some progress on it, and I, I do expect that we'll be able to respond to you. Um, it probably won't be until the beginning part of next week. Uh, but uh, I just I do want you to know we got your email. I know the board members all saw your email, and we do have a meeting tomorrow morning where we will discuss this. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Appreciate you. your time. Is the feasibility study completed, Mr. Gilberto? It, it's not. There are back there are backup documents uh, that we have posted online, uh, mostly related to the work that FXM has done. Um, trying to project out growth. Um, but the very nature of the, the scope that our primary consultant, Kleinfelder, has engaged in is that they are working with us to get our feedback to ultimately finalize a report that would be basically ready to go to town meeting. And as we all know, we're not at that point in time right now. So uh, we have improved for those who are at home and watching as well. Um, Mr. Ross has brought up you know, uh, an important point. Um, we've added additional documents on the wastewater planning webpage since the last workshop was held three weeks ago, I guess it was at this point in time. Um, and included in that are some of the backup documents relative to development projections. So uh, trying to project that out. Um, but in terms of a final report from our consultant, that won't occur until we know what plan is actually being brought forward for a town meeting. It's um, going to require plan. action of the board in mm -hmm. order for Kleinfeld to complete it. In other words, right. the, the determinations that this board makes in relation to the project as it moves forward will allow them to finalize the report. So the decisions that we have to make are critical to the finalization of the report. So, so, so it's a way down the road. I think I might have misunderstood the request to be, and it's something that I'm, I'm being asked by a lot of people, though. And I think a chunk of when we did when we looked at this before the town meeting and before the town voted to you know, it spend the three million dollars to do this. A portion of that was going to be directed at, you know, the economic growth that might be yielded from this. So, are you saying that there's other data points that they would need to fit fit into that feasibility of, study? Mr. Ross, that I think is specifically looking for us. Some of the assumptions that we're making in relation to um, single family gallonage usage. And the ratio to for condos and business condos and, and other entities, and how we give the common denominator, um, some of the factors, the minutia that go into those that those data points is I think what he's looking for. So he can back into it too and can verify that what we're saying is true, which is great. Um, but again, as the town administrator put out, some of that data is in relation to private property owners and their water usage and specific figures, which is not necessarily public domain. Um, so we're working through it. Okay. But it's more specific to you know, what 
how do we get to our assumptions? You know, when we come to, these are the assumptions we're making. Back it up, basically. And he's looking for the backup information to verify how we, how we got it, how we come to those conclusions. Okay, I see. But it's not so much the, the new growth and all that. that. That stuff's pretty much readily available. You have to accept it. Okay. So, but it's the client building stuff and the assumptions that we're using in our formulas that he's looking for. Correct. Pretty much. Yeah. Sorry, this isn't usually a Q and A, but yeah. here he no. is. So. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's correct. I, I am interested in some of the minutia about some of the assumptions. Uh, I have seen the FXM reports that have been posted. That's very helpful and it's full of good information. Um, but it certainly doesn't have all of the information that, that I'm looking for. Yeah, you're primarily looking for water usage information, I believe, and how it how it apportions cost. Yes, and, and really, I'm looking for some more information. The, the FXM report shows that in all of the towns with uh, sewerage, the value of condos is lower uh, in sewerage communities than communities that, that uh, only have septic. And because of the fairness clause, I'm interested in exploring that a little bit more because it seems like our property value is going to go down due to sewerage, according to the FXM report. So uh, I'm looking for a little bit more information about that as well. Thank you. It, it, to that point, what we're trying to do is get to a point where <clears throat> when as betterments are made on property owners, if they're if, when they're made on property owners, you know, we have to, people can, can seek an abatement on it or, or question it. We need to be able to back it up. So we want to make sure that the data we're using, the assumptions we're making, are correct and legitimate. And if what he's saying is true, so be it. You know, and the current data that we're using does not necessarily show that. So that's where this is where we're pushing the pause button and say, "Listen, we're going to look at this a little more closely, make sure that the numbers can be justified, and on appeal, make sure that they can be defended." So, so he's on target. Okay. I would just caution on how far we bring this conversation. It wasn't, it wasn't here, and there's a lot of interested people. I'm just saying that we keep going here. We're going to get emails of you guys talked about wastewater, never said so. Yeah. So no, I'm just no, I'm just being really, I, I, and I appreciate the commentary, Mr. I hope you understand though that if this becomes a full blown back and forth, we're going to get people saying, well, how come I didn't know we were talking about wastewater? So I'm just that. That's my only. Hopefully the general public knows wastewater has been a topic of yeah. discussion for seven, eight, nine years. But we told a bit unavoidable. When I started and we jo and we, we, we were joining, Madam joining the agreement with the Endover. The discussion was on how are we going to usher usher in sewer. That's years in the making. This isn't an overnight decision, and the board talks about it at every single meeting. And for those people that are joining us. There is public comment, and this gentleman showed up in person to ask a question, and he's also been emailing us. So we're going to talk about sewer. We have been talking about sewer. Whether sewer is printed on the agenda, it's a topic that we regularly discuss and have been discussing at least since 2015, probably before that. So this is not a new topic for us. It's not a thing that we just woke up on a whim and decided. Let's put, let's put sewer in here. It's part of our agreement that we signed with the Andover. We talk about it a lot. We talk about trash and wastewater <laughs> all the time. And Madam Chair, I only say that because uh, I'd say 50% of the top complaints were transparency that no one knew when we were going to talk about it even though we publicized it. So we told the public at every single meeting and the last board meeting that we promise that if it becomes a larger discussion, everybody will know. So again, it's more of, I agree with you that it's always going to come up, but I just want to be sensitive to the fact that um, we've been told over and over through email, Facebook, face-to-face, -face, pigeon, you know, uh, <laughs> however else that it gets discussed and no one knew about it. And I just don't want that that's why I'm I think overly sensitive about having going in too much to it without it being an agenda item because I guarantee you this will come up on Facebook tomorrow that it was discussed and no one knew about it. I can understand where you're coming from, but we have actively 
actively been talking about this, actively been studying this, actively been engaging experts on it, actively had teams of people working on this. It's actively been updated at every meeting. That's our job here. We're doing the work that we need to do for the community. And we have been studying this issue, like I said, since 2015 and probably before that. So it's not a new topic and I would never, we have public comment and I would never tell someone they can't discuss a topic because public comment varies wildly here about what people want to talk about and tell us about and that's part of our job too. I understand where you're coming from but we also have to do our job and let people address us during public comment and try to address, it's usually not an interactive but it's such a, it is large now. This issue is large and we're trying to move it forward. So we, we should welcome that kind of an interaction. Oh, don't get me wrong. Nobody wanted... watches our meetings. They're boring. I just I got two to... texts saying yeah, I didn't know you were really talking about. No, no, I want to clarify though. No, the <laughs> public comment is definitely needed. But, yes, yes. but again, I think we've made it very clear. We made it very clear at the last meeting that unless it's a public hearing on sewer, the back and forth will not happen. And that's what I'm just saying that we said that and now it's happening and you know like there there's going to be those that reference it so okay, I'm just I understand I do understand yeah. but it is I said it last meeting we, need to, we definitely need to move on hopefully that addressed what you're concerned about but we we're not ignoring that and we want to get the answers for everybody us included and we do have the experts that the town voted to uh, for to be hired to look into this, and we definitely want you and all of us to have that backup data, like Mr. O'Leary explained. I thought it was a, I thought it was taking a different track that I've been looking for too in terms of the economic development. But and for anybody that's listening in, I don't know if anyone else had public comment, but I do see. I is anyone else here that wants to speak in public comment? Okay, Mr. Gilberto, any hands raised? All right. I see any. Okay, good. So we do we do have to move on, and um, and um, we have to go to our public hearing. So First of two. Our public hearing is the next thing. The Seven thirty public hearing. If I could just read the notice. In accordance. This is in accordance with Chapter One Thirty Eight of the. Massachusetts General Laws in in-person and virtual public hearing will be held by the Select Board on Monday, November 21st, 2022 in room 14 Town Hall, 235 North Street, North Reading, Massachusetts, in-person and via virtual technology at 7.30 p.m. on the application of Mario's Restaurant, Wayama Group, LLC, for a change of license type from a common victual wine and malt to a common victual or all alcohol to be exercised at 20 G Main Street, North Reading, Massachusetts, in a one-story building of approximately 1,200 square feet with kitchen, dining area, and restrooms. Entrance, exit doors located in the front and the rear of the building. The publication was 11-10-2022 by the North Reading Select Board, and it had the Zoom meeting access phone and dial by location with the local number link. So do we have our license, our applicant here? If you could please come to the, come to the, come to a microphone on the podium, wherever you're comfortable. Doesn't matter. All right, and if you could please introduce yourself and. My name is Lumia Reyes. I am one of the owners of Mario's in North Valley. Welcome. Thank you. All right, and could you just give us a little bit of what your application is? We have it in the packet, and if you could just yes. give us so a quick summary. So we currently summer. have the beer and wine license, and we just want to change it to a full liquor license. So we would have a little bar, and we'll have about eight seats there. Okay. We'll update that in room, obviously. And, and, and any questions? Mr. Gilberto. Just through you, Madam Chair, will there be uh, a change or alteration of the premises that's going to need to come before the board, meaning anything with regard to the layout of the restaurant? I know no, you don't you we, don't have a bar right now, right? You serve alcohol from behind the counter. Right. So we do have a counter. Yes. And then that's where the bar would be. Right in that same area. Mm -hmm. okay. Are you changing the number of seats in total in the restaurant? No. No. We're just adding the bar stools where the bar that we have right now 
the counter okay. has space for those parcels. Okay, thank you. Okay, any, uh, okay, questions? Lemoncello? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. course. These are great ideas. This one on the menu. How late are you going to stay up then? <laughs> <laughs> on Monday. Yeah, yeah, Monday. <laughs> <Monday. laughs> we talk too much here. <laughs> we talk too much to make it anyway. Um, Mr. Studo, any questions, Mr. Walner? So where are you, are you going to leave the register where it is? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. you're just adding. We're just adding more stools, updating, you know, the big part of it a little bit, you know, the dining room. Okay. Um, and putting some stools and doing a full bar behind the, uh, the counter. A, a full bar, okay. Mm -hmm. So if there's, <laughs> If there's any construction, I think that's what Mr. Gilberto is getting at. So construction plans, right, they have to be reviewed, right? If it's a, any kind of a change to the interior. But we may want to look at what your yeah, building plans are just to make sure there isn't any need for a change of premises. Yeah. Okay. Do you have, did you hire a contractor to do that Not work? Yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you haven't done permitting yet for it. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Until we get the license. Right. And this is for immediate, the, for the remainder of this year, uh, or just for the January? remainder of this year and then moving forward. Mm -hmm. Are you going to specifically have a bartender? <coughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> so that <coughs> if it's the remainder of this year, it ends in the end of December. Yeah. It won't be much time. Not a lot. And it's not even. If it's not even, so you're going to start, if, if this gets approved, you'd be, so if, if it gets approved be, and goes through, you'll be starting in January 1st. You'll be so starting. Because yeah. yeah. so we, renew. we just renewed the beer and wine. Right. It doesn't take time. Yeah. So oh, so you're a little ahead of your ass. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Because it still has to go through the ABC. That's right. right. Yes. Yeah. So right. It's a lot more. Right. Yeah. So I'm just heartened by the fact that you're here before us looking to expand yeah. your menu. You know, yeah, and your yeah, business is doing well, which is great to hear and see, and we appreciate your uh, oh, continued money. success, you know, so yeah. money. We should nothing more than that. That's great. Smart. Okay. Yeah. So shall we, do we have anything yeah. else, Mr. Gilberto? Yeah. So I think the point, I think the, the, the point that Mr. Lear made between <coughs> is there is a fee associated with this. It's a $250 right. application fee. It's not the full license fee. Um, they've actually been proactive. I believe you've already yes, applied to renew. Yes, already did everything. Yes. So we may need to adjust that application once the ABCC takes action yes. to approve, presumably. Uh, but they've actually applied to renew already mm -hmm. for a beer and wine license. Yes, but, but there's a different fee for both of those. That's and correct. If so they, the, if they if they get the license now, they have to pay the. the it's difference. not. It's not. Uh, it's for the new license. So, so why? But if they're going to operate. Well, I don't know, are you going to get the ABCC approval before the end of the yeah. year? Yes, it will. You think so? Uh, but the license that we were doing is for next year anyways. Right, right. No. So it'll be the difference for next year. But your your application for renewal is for a beer and wine license? Yes. Not for a full hour. Of so course. that we're going to have to... So that's going to have to change. That we're going to yes. have to address. Well, that would be for the difference, right? But yeah, we're not yes. looking to double charge yeah, yeah. We're just looking no, to make I, sure I, that I'm it's the right about license. about being hit for six weeks in 2022. We don't intend to charge them other than the $250 application fee. Okay. Because they won't, they can't, yeah. they can't convert until they get a, the full right. approval. Okay. That, that's, right. that's yes. saying, you know, if it, Six by the time weeks. you get the ABCC approval and stuff like that, you've got two weeks left in the year, maybe if you're lucky. Right. Yeah. right. And, uh, and, and it may mean that we need to renew their licenses of beer and wine and then actually well, grant them the license. You can always take a vote that it's to, to take effect pending ABCC on January 1st and then come back in. We can make that a part of our motion. Sure. Yep. So that we, we don't even have to worry about this. So you've got the renewal, you know that there's, what's the difference in fee? Yeah. Twenty-eight and 46? 28 to 46. So okay. $1,800. All right. All right, so I think everybody's on board here. It sounds yeah, like. Yeah, and all the local permitting. The permitting for the They'll also have to do building permit. Yeah. So. If you do in any renovation, you know you have to come back here with the plans and let us know. And it sounds like you're having a bartender, and 
you're, it sounds like you're expanding your bar there. Yes, a little bit of updates, yes. Yeah, it so would require so push rush, yes. That would have to come back to, okay. but I think everybody's on board with giving you the green light, but I don't know, we have to have a motion. Yep, yeah, right. Madam Chair, I move to approve the change of license type from a common victualler wine involved to a common victualler all alcohol from Aria's restaurant, uh, Wayama Group LLC, 23G Main Street, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Second. Motion by Mr. Walner, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you. Great. 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 Look forward to it. Great. Good luck. Yeah. Like moving forward. Thank you. All right. And our next order of business is a public hearing on the fiscal year 2023 tax classification. I'm just going to read the public hearing notice. Uh, property tax classification. The select board will hold a public hearing on Monday, November 21st, 2022, at 8 p.m. to determine the percentage of the local tax levy to be borne by each class of real and personal property for the fiscal year 2023 in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 56. This hearing is anticipated to be held in person in room 14 of Town Hall, located at 235 North Street, North Reading, Massachusetts, and via virtual technology as follows. The public hearing notification contains the Zoom links, uh, the internet access, the telephone, the mobile, the dial by location meaning ID, and the Zoom link notification. And that's by the select board. Okay. Good evening. We're joined by our assessor. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. Tonight's our annual classification called every, this time every year. I would like to take a moment and recognize the staff in the assessing office for their hard work, dedication throughout the year. Actually, for the last three years. Um, two years, starting in 2019, we went through a complete data conversion, which I've spoke about. And then right from the data conversion, we went right into a full revaluation. This year, was just an intern valuation year. So we did our regular work, not double duty, which gave us a chance to clean up our offices too. <laughs> so with that being said, the interim adjustments and values were certified by the Bureau of Local Assessment to ensure the values are derived utilizing a methodology base of accepted mass appraisal practices and are supported with current market values as, as evidence and are uniformly and equitably applied to all properties. Personal property accounts are reviewed for appropriate listings and valuation of assets along with the cost and depreciation schedule. So that just summarizes what an interim adjustment is. The statistics must conform to the commissioner's minimum standard for certification. The purpose is for measuring the level and uniformity of assessments before and after the interim revaluation. I'm happy to report that our values and our new growth were certified timely, actually a little early on October 14, 2022. The new growth certified at 1,027,642. The estimate was 850, but that's a work in progress. We're estimating the 850 in the month of February, and I don't finalize until October. For FY23, the average single family is $745,319, up from $659,180. We brought on 12 new houses this year, which is not uncommon. We usually do bring 10 to 12. 
the values are up by 13.4% this year. So that's just a quick overview of what's been going on in the assessing office. For tonight, your role is to vote on four decisions. Select a minimum residential factor, selection of an open space discount, granting of a residential exemption, or granting of a small commercial exemption. This is just a slide to show you where our levy's gone. Uh, starting from 2018, uh, you can see it was 49, $49,770,000. Today's levy for fiscal 23 is $59,437,563. So it, it is escalating, but at a cautious speed. What is a split tax rate? A split tax rate allows a community to increase the commercial, industrial, and personal property share of the tax levy up to 50% more than the residential. You're not raising any additional taxes. You are only shifting the burden. The tax rate in North Reading was split in the years 1985 and 1988, just for a little history. This slide is just what we have on our inventory today. Um, with, we have 4,310 single families. Our condos, as we know, are increasing by 50 units a year. So we're up to 957 on those, 41 on multifamilies, 25 on mixed use properties. That could be a commercial and an apartment. Uh, let's see, commercial properties we have 225, industrial properties we have 85. Personal property we have 531 accounts. Now on to our votes. For the open space discount, we do not have any classified open space. All of our large tracts of land are accounted for in on the tax rolls. We have two chapter properties under 61A, so they are being taxed. So for this vote, we do not have any that would qualify for an open space discount. The residential exemption. The residential exemption, this was actually created in communities on the South Shore for people that did not live in that house as their domicile 12 months out of the year. They vacation homes, second homes. So you do have the option of adding a 20% shift in the residential class. I want to explain this, and we'll see it on a slide further down. <clears throat> when you shift that 20%, you're shifting from our lower in value homes, the 20% across the board to the higher end homes. That's how that works. Again, we're not raising any more levy. We're not raising any more taxes. We're taking the same amount of tax and we're shifting. That's all we're doing. So on this next slide, so, you can I'm see. I'm sorry, just let me ask you a quick question on that. So a residential exemption doesn't go to everybody that is a resident? Mm -mm. No, it doesn't. So what it would do is you have this minimum value home, and that 
your middle value home, those would receive the exemption in the amount of the tax levy that they're saving gets shifted to the higher rent homes. So those homes tax but would exactly, go which is why the whole purpose of this residential exemption was created, because you take people in Barnstable, people in vacation areas, right? They don't live there year round. That's their second home. So the people that did live there year round had usually not the higher end homes, they had the average homes. So that was the purpose in this creation of the residential exemption. How do you determine what's lower and higher end? Is it that 745, anything under and then anything above? Exactly. Okay. Thank you. So here on this slide, and I'm not gonna read these numbers unless you want me to, but it's just showing you how it shifts from the average single family reduces the tax on the lower end homes, everything below, by $811.42, but it's raising it on the other side. And I did um, a 15% and then I did a 20%, just to give you an idea of up to, well, the 5% increments. Do we have any questions on that? Did you do a, did you do an itemization of how many homes would be cons, would be would, would benefit qualify? from this and how many homes would increase? You know, there's how many how much of our housing stock would fall under that 745 and how much is that or above? I did actually run that report but I didn't include it in here, and I don't want to give you a number oh, that I can't remember off the top of my head, and forgive me for that, because I did <laughs> run the report. No, I'm just kidding. I must have got sidetracked. <coughs> <laughs> okay. I know it wasn't, it wasn't me. Under 745? Is that what you're saying? Right. So 745-319 is your Assess. average single family home for fiscal 23. So it would be anything under that would get the exemption. Exactly. And anything over that would pay more. The additional. Yep. I'm just curious if it's, you know, how many? 10% of our housing stock yeah. is under that or 50% or this would probably be mostly condos. I can tell you one of the reports that I, when I was running these reports to just see where it fell, I did 500,000 houses under 500,000. Mm -hmm. I had 17, 17, 20, 20. Single family? Single family. How many? 20. They were assessed under 500,000? Were those houses or condos? Houses. I don't, it, so if we're, for this purpose, you want, you're only dealing with the residential housing stock. You're not dealing with the condos. Oh. Those, those are a whole separate item. Yeah, there's not, there's not many. That I can tell you. I mean, to me, I think in most of our minds, you would think, oh, if it's going to help the older, the seniors, you know, but that's not necessarily who's living in those houses. That's right. It could be a single <laughs> bachelor who's got plenty of money, just chose to live in a smaller home. You know I mean? So for the qualifications, you do have to go through the town clerk's office. You do have to verify that they are in there that they domicile that property. You do have to deal, you know, check with town clerks to make sure they're on the voter registration. In some cases, they're not here six months out of the year either. Yeah. You know, they're in Florida for six years. Right, right. 
So there's there's a lot of legs, yeah. if you will, that go into this decision as to whether you. So those it. numbers really can't be firm, unless you well, would know exactly how many or. Exactly. Yeah. Right. If if there was an entertainment for the board yeah. that you wanted to put ten percent or twenty percent. At that time, we would have to, have to firm go and confirm everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just a Mr. And it would graduate. So, like, if someone was just 1% below, it would be pushing 1% up on the other side. So, these would be the maximums that you'd be picking extremes on both ends, correct? Yes. Any other questions on the residential? Well, it doesn't have to be 10%, it could be 5%. Oh, right. Could I, be I mean, yeah, right. I right. wasn't going to do the scenario yeah. out by increments of yeah, yeah, no. 1% yeah. or whatever. So the small commercial exemption, this works very similar to the residential exemption, except for DUA, which is the Department of Unemployment Assistance, sends assessing offices a list of businesses that would have to qualify through here. The value has to be less than a million dollars, and they have to employ fewer than 10 people. We have 67 businesses out of our 310 businesses in town that possibly would qualify. So it shifts the percentage to the businesses that are valued over the million. Over the million, right. It's the same methodology as the residential exemption, yeah. Mr. Mr. Stewart. I, I'm just curious. How is how is the business value? Because business valuation can be expensive, just to get to that. I mean, it's uh, it, you know, what you know. Like, is there goodwill? There's like, so I I right. I feel like there's, in practice this would just be a nightmare. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, one hundred percent. One hundred and ten percent. Okay. Actually, no pun intended. Um, it would be a lot, and then we still would have to verify with the DUA on a specific date that there were fewer than ten employees, and then we, you know, you set it up in units so that it reduces the ten percent on the lower end and ships the ten percent to the higher end. That's it. Are there any other questions on the commercial exemption? I want to. I want to ask, but I'm afraid to because of Mr. Studo. Let's say. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna ask it though. Let's say um, that the uh, sewer project, for example. I'm sorry, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to talk so about it. While we're talking about this, because I just want to <laughs> understand the mechanics. Let's say the town says yes to that sewer project. Yes, there's a, there's a shift of uh, taxes, an additional tax that all the parcels, residential and commercial. And let's say the board may basically adopts this. So that extra percentage is also going to be subject to the reduction that 10, if we if we said yes to this. So that extra percentage that we tacked on, that's gonna be part of a 10% reduction that then gets shifted over to those other businesses. To the higher, to the higher value businesses. Okay. It would shift over to there. It's and funny same you're saying that, Kate, because I thought about that when I was putting Yeah, this of course you, yes. You, you, you've been fielding all of those <laughs> questions, yeah. So, and that would be the same, let's say, if we did the residential, even though it's maybe 20 homes, if there any of those are located on the, well, any of those, actually, the extra amount of 
the taxes would go on to the other, other yeah. ones. Okay. But now that you mention it, Madam Chair, <laughs> if we did get that growth, I think it would be a lot cleaner to just do a split tax rate at that point, which is, by the way, what the end result is. It takes a while you know, to I get. I agree. Right. So. That's maybe it would, it, and it, If you think about that, too, it would, in my opinion, it's only my opinion, if the town ever gets to that point of a split tax rate, it's even across the board. This year, I mean, what if yeah. what if people didn't report to the DUA accurately? Yeah, we have two hundred contracts. You know, what if they the said their thing. business is only worth you know nine hundred and eighty nine thousand dollars? <laughs> what if? God bless you. Thank you. Um, you know, the the split tax rate is yeah, even. It's cleaner. It's definitely viable. If you ask me. But that's just my opinion. Okay. Madam Chair, if I might, oh, just, just well, before yeah. we move forward, and normally I do this before the presentation is made, uh, just for full disclosure purposes, I just want to uh, disclose that I have uh, family members who live in town and own both commercially and residential properties uh, in the community, uh, real estate in the community. Uh, but where the Board of Assessors are recommending to the board a single tax rate rather than a split tax rate it would not pose a conflict if a split tax rate were proposed i would be recusing myself um, but since it's not being proposed uh, i feel a liberty to participate okay. thanks Thank mr o'leary so since a single tax rate is being proposed maybe we could move this along quickly. yeah maybe we could <laughs> <laughs> all right all right i'm moving it i'm moving it fast it's our it's our fault here yeah yes but these are things that you think about and these are things people ask you to run these numbers so and there's people watching that might be wondering those things yeah well, one of the important things to recognize yeah. by my manager is that you know, we're the, the, right now the commercial club. industrial tax here's base Steve. is shrinking here's it's, it's actually shrinking you know, which is contrary to what our goals have been right. Right. in order to try and grant residential there you are. Tax payers some some tax so relief. Really, yeah. So as we're moving forward here, yeah. you know, unless there's some substantive changes according to um, the plans here, uh, which really means sewerage, uh, you're not going to see any dramatic change or shift uh, in the residential split. And if that being the case, and Peter is okay with that, then this is what you're going to get. Right. Uh, you're not even going to approach the possibility of even just talking about a split tax rate and having it work. So as we're seeing now in the last couple of years, we see the actual commercial industrial um, personal property tax portion shrinking in the residential portion of the tax burden exponentially growing for the residential taxpayer. So um, as we move forward with other subject matters, such as sewage, it's something to be considered. This is what we've been talking about all along, we've talked about every year. But as we move forward, if we're looking to actually get to a point where we can consider a split tax rate and I'd have to recuse myself, we're not going to see it unless we uh, allow for some new growth areas. The new growth has to come to commercial industry. And we, we, see, we see this. I hope you're right that people are watching because we see this every year. And these are the things that keep us concerned and worried about the fiscal direction of the town. We see these numbers every year. We have this public hearing every year, and we see these, what, what we're seeing. And, yeah. and what we're seeing is, as Sessa pointed out, is we've seen 12 new single family homes static. come. Our, our new growth is based upon houses. You know, single, 12 new single family homes in Poli, That's primarily. Right. You know, as far well, as the new growth. Sheds, decks, pools, a lot of pools. Yeah, oh a lot God. of pools. No, a lot Everybody's of pools. Sort of no, but I'm just saying, as far as, you know, no we're, not see, we're not seeing in the commercial area. No commercial area. business. We're not seeing in the commercial That's area. The problem. And That's therefore, you know, more of the tax burden is being shared up, uh, being um, paid on. for by residential property owners. Yeah, that's this thing. Mr. Mr. Student. We've talked about this in the past. However, yeah. to effectively have a split tax rate, how much of that yellow needs to go away? 
<coughs> Excuse me. So, not to outdate myself with how long I've been doing assessment. <laughs> I don't want to do that. This is workout world, no job. But I can tell you, <laughs> back to 1988, wow. it would be a 70-30 split. Um, I still kind of roll by that rule of thumb because in a bedroom community like we are, it's a good ratio mix. If you have 30% of this pie, for your commercial, industrial, and personal property values, you've got a good tax base at that point. And you don't have to shift all the way up to the, to the maximum, which right now would be 50, 1.50. You wouldn't have to do that. You could do the split in phases. Mm -hmm. You could do 1.10 the first year, see the, how that's rolling and maintaining our commercial, industrial, and personal property values, or are we losing business? Because you don't want to get to that point. So if, if you look at that 30%, and, and it, again, that's just my opinion. Um, it's a good ratio for a community of this type in size. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We just don't want that static, and that's what we're, we're seeing. Static right. or shrinking? Shrinking. We're shrinking. Static and shrinking. Yeah, I remember yeah. being 218, not too long ago. I change this pie every year. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be 90 next year. Oh, easy. Easy. Like, uh, easy. Yellow. I've already ran some numbers. We're going to be doing the meeting with flashlights because we can't turn the <laughs> lights on. Maybe if it goes to 90. Maybe maybe you can be the big pie better than yellow, something nice like a blue. <laughs> Okay. All right. Great. You pick the color. <laughs> you pick the color. In all. all right, folks. Okay, so we'll get back to the classification <laughs> part. So the select board may shift the town's tax burden from the residential class to the commercial, commercial, industrial, and personal property classes. As long as the shift does not exceed the minimum residential factor. The minimum residential factor right now is 88.9, as that pie shows. This means that no more than 11.71% of the residential class burden can be shifted to the commercial, industrial, and personal <coughs> property classes. The following pages contain information on the impact of any shift of the tax burden. At this time, the Board of Assessors is recommending for the fiscal 2023 a factor of one or a single tax rate. And this slide, and I know it's there's so many numbers and there's just no way to make it any clearer for the public. Um, I wish I could. So in this, in this scenario, you can see the residential value. We're at 3,750,844,201. So being at the 88.31%, the proposed tax rate for physical um, 23 is 1399. If you were to shift the rate by 10%, it would reduce the residential down to 12.5, $12.59. And you can see up to the maximum shift of, of 1.50 would reduce the rate down to seven. Now, on the other side, the commercial rate would increase at the maximum shift of 1.5 to $20.99. And that would carry through for industrial and personal property. So commercial, industrial, and personal property are the same rate. We don't have different rates. Are there any questions on this page? No questions, right? 
So this, this page is in here just to show you from 2019, our tax rate was 1558. The lower valued house was 337.9. The average was 578.307. And the high was 1,017,900. Roll that forward to today for a fiscal 23. Our lower valued house is the 580. And our highest house is over two million. It's two million already actually. So you can see that that's our shift in the residential class for commercial in 2019. Our lower value commercial industrial property was 889,100. And the high was 1,321,700. 2023, we're at 800,000 for a low end commercial property and 24,5 for the high. And that, I just put that in there just so that you can see, you know, where the values are going and how the averages are increasing. I mean, if you look at our levy and look at how the values are steadily increasing, you know, five, 15, 20,000 a year, it, it all makes sense. We're heading in the right direction. We're just all along the residential side. Any questions on this page? How are we heading in the right direction? No, no, no. <laughs> Meaning the levy. We're, but it's all on the residential. Well, it, it, again, it's just important to note that you know, three years ago, four years ago, the average residential family taxes on the average home was $9,000. It's now $10,400. You know, the only things change is what the market value of the of the homes are. The homes are the same. It's just that the market value and and as the ratios shrink with the commercial industrial, more shifts to the residential and you're paying fourteen hundred dollars more over a three year period, four year period. So Does yeah, well, well, we're heading in the right direction. It's it, it's you know, and this is what people are saying, and we're all experiencing, because we're all taxpayers here. It's a, um, you know, that, that's a substantial uh, increase just based upon market valuations. Um, again, our cost of business isn't going down, and that's based upon, this is taxing to the max too, right? The crop two and a half plus new growth. Yes. You know, so it's, so in order to maintain our level of services, this is what we have to do, unless we can, uh, Buy some new growth, the burden is still going to be picked up by the residential single family home homeowners. Okay, so are we? So we're doing some, we're going to be taking some vote. The recommendation is single tax rate. What was your recommendation on? I'm assuming it was, did you do you make a recommendation on the exemptions? I'm assuming it's a no on those. Um, the Board of Assessors has never made a recommendation okay. on that. But, but the single tax rate is, is, does anyone have any more questions on that before we take it to the vote? No? Any discussion? Seems pretty clear, right? So yeah. should we, can we call for a vote? I just started walking through them. Okay, Madam Chair, I move to select a minimum residential factor of 1.0 as recommended by the Board of Assessors. Second. Wait a minute, is this, this is a public hearing. I'm Wait sorry. Oh. I totally forgot. I, I just realized it. I didn't take any public comment on, on the Mario's either. Is anyone here that wishes to speak on the Mario's application? <laughs> they, I think they were here and left with them. Hearing none? I think we'll they were happy. The <laughs> the 
<laughs> is anyone here or joining us online that wishes to speak about this in public comment about the tax classification or any of the recommended or the recommendation of the assessor? Hearing none and seeing none, we'll close the public hearing portion of the meeting. And now we'll go to the vote, which is a sit which Mr. Walner made the motion. Do we have a second? Mr. O'Leary, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 See you unanimous. Um, okay. um, Madam Chair, I move to not, okay, so I move to not establish a residential exemption. Second. Motion by Mr. Walner, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Madam Chair, I move. To, not to establish a commercial exemption. Second. Motion by Mr. Walner. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Madam Chair, I move to recommend the fiscal 2023 property tax levy at $59,431,101.94, which is $6,461.06 less than the levy limit. Second. Motion by Mr. Walner, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Madam Chair, I move to recommend to the Board of Assessors that the fiscal year 2023 proposed tax rate be set at $13.99 per $1,000 of valuation. Second. Motion by Mr. Walner, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. So we have open space? Yes. Yeah, we didn't get to the open space, I'm waiting. We're waiting, okay. We don't even, do you have a motion on that? Space. We don't even have any oh, property that would be We don't have property that would be applicable right, to, right? right? So we're just assuming it'd be a motion not to recommend that. Yeah, <coughs> unfortunately, you still have, still have to take that vote. Oh, that's okay. That's not valid. Oh. Okay. Do we, do we have a motion? Make it up. We don't, we'll make it do we have a we motion don't not to recommend? Not, right. to, not to establish. <laughs> not to establish. An open space exemption. Rich, you can use the same one as a residential exemption, just, just like change the word. Space. Yeah. It's the same okay. thing. Okay. okay. Madam Chair, I move to not establish an open <laughs> space exemption. Second. Motion by Mr. Warner, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you very much. That was very You're informative. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We're picking your brain about a lot of this stuff. That's so we okay. appreciate that you're able to help us out, help us through this. Not a problem. Okay. That's what I'm here for. Mm -hmm. All right. And it makes sense. Okay. So we're going to thank you again. And we're going to move on to our next order of business, which is a transportation committee and a vote to establish that. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. We'll, we'll turn it over to you, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam moment. Chair. So we have a draft of a transportation um, committee. Um, I guess I'll call it a charge, uh, if you will. Um, and you see that there's a listing there that's been developed, I believe in conjunction with Mr. Walner and with Ms. Hartman in some discussion. Um, I think there were a couple of areas where we sort of struggled a, a, a little bit. Um, one being, where is the appropriate representation of the different subject matter areas? Is it you know, best to have you know, representatives of the different committees that we have? So for example, veteran services or elder services. Um, I think that the director of public services intention is to have the staff be involved in the discussion. Um, but I think that that was sort of a question that we had. I know there was some comment about the appointing authority too in the last discussion we had as well. Um, and someone suggested perhaps I ought to be the appointing authority. My recommendation to the board is that we have, if we're gonna have a committee that's set up um, as a sort of a public body, if you will, 
that it be representatives of existing committees rather than staff and that the staff help under Ms. Hartman's direction um, and that it be appointed by the select board. Um, I can tell you I've already asked Lillian on her first day to help us in transportation, Mr. Walner knows that. Um, so yeah, I think, I you know, the staff kind of knows the charge. Um, but, you know, obviously it's the board's decision about how it wants to proceed. So I'm going to stop there. I don't know if Rich or Lillian have anything they want to add. As the motion, draft motion reads now, um, it says consideration for appointing folks who might represent the interests of veterans, who might represent the interests of elderly, who might represent the interests of people with disabilities. Um, I like the openness of that language because if a particular committee doesn't have someone who's passionate about transportation who will really attend the meetings, and a citizen volunteer is willing to step up and say, I have a disability, I'm not on that commission, but can I be on transportation? Um, that gives you the most flexibility to sure. still appoint a committee member or a different member of the public. Okay. That makes sense too because of the fact that we have <laughs> already have a lot of committees and commissions and we have some interest, but it's hard to get volunteers. We talked about having a volunteer committee at our strategic yeah. plan just to generate some excitement about serving. So it does kind of make sense that, you know, where someone stepped up to volunteer on one committee, they may not necessarily want to serve on another one just because they're on that committee. So if we have that broad ability, I think that's a great idea. I believe Mr. O'Leary wanted it to be the just something out of our hands and let the TA appoint. But when we, if it's going to be a committee that we establish, I would, I would tend to agree that we should be doing the appointing, but we should do it the way we're doing it by getting a recommendation. Maybe we just appoint through the recommendation of, you know, public um, services directors or TA, do it like that. All right, so do we have a motion? Do we have further discussion? Let's hear from our our colleagues on this. Mr. Gilberto, I saw you had your hand raised. I'm sorry, I don't want to dominate the conversation because a lot of work has gone into it, but I do yes. want folks to know that you know this is has been and will continue to be a priority priority regardless of any yeah. you know discussion on a, on a committee. I don't want folks to think that I or Ms. Hartman or anybody else don't take seriously the issues for sure, um, but uh, you know, we certainly do, but whatever the, whatever the board's pleasure, we certainly we don't. Work. We don't. I, I, I don't. I'm not going to speak for my colleagues, but we know this is important to you. Mm. We also know all of the other things you're juggling right now, mm. and we, we, we appreciate your jumping right in and getting right on board with this. So, I don't know who's think don't think that we think you don't take no, it. No, I, I don't Thank you. because we know you do. Thank you. Uh, anyway. Mamma mia. All right. Mr. <laughs> Mamma mia. Mr. O'Leary. Um, on top of everything else, you know, where's the MBTA, Michael? I mean, really, we, we know this is a tough one. Well, with this committee, it's another one that we've been talking about. We've been talking about this. Look back to how many years this has been on our strategic plan. Believe me, but we're appreciative of it. Well, we could have had seven acres. It would have been a nice little. <laughs> All right, well, then we could have made it a bus <laughs> depot. Why not? All right. Could have done a lot of things. <laughs> Let's go. Not, I, that's not, not everybody always shares the vision. Could have, so, would have, you know. could have. <sighs> All right. Well, we had the majority work. sharing a vision. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have two thirds. That's I know. Right. That's true. Yeah. But that's true. We went. We we did. We worked hard on that. But there was a different difference of opinion on that. Mr. O'Leary, did you have your hand raised? No, no, Mr. Walner, you wanted to participate in this discussion. I'll, I'll just say that the write-up is great. I, I like all the write-up and everything else like that. Just, um, you know, when the, it's basically, it's your people, it's your department, it's your, I mean, everybody who's involved in the to you. So, um, you know, when it says on an as-needed basis, you're gonna be needed right from the very beginning, you know, on a routine basis. And, you know, um, select board members come and go, this is largely going to be on you. However, we write it in. And so if the met, if the approach doesn't work, we change it. You know, but um, it's largely our success will be based on how it's set up. So I'm glad we have a transportation plan. Great. Yeah, and again, I just want to concur. I think it's critical that it 
it lived well beyond the term of anybody sitting here. Right. Yeah. It'd be an ongoing mm -hmm. uh, committee that's going to be Amen to that. assessing and Absolutely. helping us. Yeah, I mean, address yeah, I mean, the biggest thing seniors have told us, Kim, Kim and I were in the, <laughs> Kim and Zelly and I were did that, that summit, the two biggest things that the seniors, the 75 people who showed up, it was property taxes and was transportation. I mean, that's mm -hmm. always been the mm -hmm. biggest thing, and that showed up in our survey a year and a half, two years ago. Same thing. So it's very important. And it's good that we have it all in one place as opposed to spread out here, spread out there. It needs to be centralized and moved up a little more time. And the write up is great. So they meet those objectives. We have a huge success going forward. Mrs. Gonzalez. Yeah, it's critical. We, it, it's critical very necessary in town but my one concern is it says seven voting members are you concerned with getting seven voting members to yeah, that's, that's a, a big quorum i think uh yeah i i mean it's i am on we are all on a lot of committees and that can be challenging let me ask can that in your opinion can five do just more because of that Meaning, I'm also more concerned, not just to get, we want the qualified people on it, but more that the more opinions, the more bureaucracy, the slower things move. I mean, that just, I, I haven't seen a seven. Yeah, it, it's big. Five's already sometimes like, you know, we'll talk about something in the executive session here a hundred times before, you know, it makes a decision. So with seven, my concern is that a great idea becomes just, you know, just a Again, just not making assumptions, just My being reality. My suggestion would be, if, if I could throw it out at you, um, to maybe have five and maybe two non-voting. I mean, if you still wanted to have seven, you know, I see that you have it itemized into who you want there, but two could be non-voting so that you have that quorum easily, more easily had. That's, that's fine with me. Yeah, um, no, the, the other thing, too, is... If you go, if you start with five, we can always expand it to seven. Correct. It's all easier. Yeah, we can to shrink expand. it too, but we can shrink it also. But you know, we yeah. want you. We want you to be able to succeed from the right. from the get go, and uh, again, all the people that you're talking about having participate here have other allegiances and responsibilities yeah. too. So it's. Uh, you know. and, I, and we all know how challenging that can be. You know, you get a meeting together and you don't get your quorum, and then you can't vote on anything. Just hard to get volunteers. Yeah. yeah, even it might not seem seem like that if it's maybe something that just meets once a month or something. But it really is really hard to get volunteers, even for something like that. Um, that would just be my only suggestion. So if you, if you want to start with seven, you can start with seven. Well, I'm coming up to. I'm just looking at the back page here. Two members, so I'm counting five volunteers, plus a select board liaison, plus a CPC liaison. Who will be voting? So is that the seven? It says seven voting members. Like the liaison doesn't necessarily have to vote, be a voting member. Yeah, I'm just trying to follow what it says, because it's, it's looking for five town volunteers. No, but the, it says the seven it says voting seven members. Voting it's members. a select board member and the community planning commission member. I'm it says a po seven voting members yeah. and two, two, one, one, one. That's seven. So you're Mr. Waller, that's the the select board member and the community planning commission would be a voting member. Yeah. And we do sometimes we do have some committees where we vote. And some we don't. So, some yeah. are. There's a voting member on EDC, there's a voting there's voting members on There's a one. voting and a non voting on EDC. Right, right. So the problem I see. So, in other words, you mean it's only five volunteers? Real doing it? the work. Right. Because I don't think you can expect the select board to do a tremendous amount of work. And I don't think you can get the CPC to do a tremendous amount of work, considering their other duties already going on. Right. So, you really have five people who are going to be trying to hit the majority of the. So, there you are. I, I mean, I think our you suggestion would three, be to. You go down to three. Three that's, voting, that's three voting men? No, I, I was thinking five. Well, just take take out the two that are voting members and just make it a committee of five with yeah. a liaison from select board Correct. and a liaison from CPC. There you go. And the liaison, those 
that it keeps you your five members, which is kind of <coughs> the intent of it, but you take out the voting ability, that way they're not, you know. So that we're present, we report yeah. back, we're involved, but we're not, we don't have to be And again, those liaison assignments change from year to year. Correct. You can't change from year to year, so if you're looking for continuity, you're not always going to get it from here. Yeah. Right, for sure, yeah. yeah. We try, we try, yeah, we, do. we try yeah, to keep, keep the people. But, okay, so can we, should we, Mr. Mr. Student? Sorry. No, I want to say, I, I think it's a great idea, just because I feel that uh, we don't think twice about how easy it is to get a ride through an app or whatever, you know, in general. Uh, but I think that for older population, I mean, I mean not even, some, just in general, let's just, Keep it that it can be it can be hard to get around right um even with granted if you have some type of disability with a handicap but even then it's not it just the in and out if you have to run multiple things so you know i think it's important and also like everything else all the all the conversations lead the sewer and when we have sewer and we open all these places we're going to need more shuttle services to get people all these places, which actually that's a reality for towns that have multiple things. So no, I think, um, and I was surprised uh, at how, not how little, like I didn't expect it, but it just, again, I grew up in Malden where it was like, you saw the, you saw it everywhere. It was just, you know, people getting, you know, rides. Maybe I'm just like looking at the wrong thing. So I was just surprised here when it was like not as big. I know I'm not comparing apples to apples, so. Just want to say it's a good idea. To help people so age in place. About five of the liaisons? I think that's a good suggestion. Yes. I don't know. So five voting plus two liaisons who Perfect. attend when available. Correct. Are you good with that? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy with that. I, I think, think that would be more successful. And associate members, I think, are already listed as a possibility. So. Mm -hmm. Anyone who wants to volunteer to help us learn about transportation on cable TV, love to meet you. <laughs> right. All right. The only suggestion I would say on that is don't have it be a three year term, just be a one year term, and that way if someone moves out of the voting and you can put the associate member in. Because you know, sometimes we see someone volunteer we see that a lot of this with someone volunteers and then they resign it's maybe not what they wanted so you want to have the ability to move that person mm -hmm. in that that'd be my other suggestion but i think it's fine we make those changes are we voting on this yes with those with the amendment to just the Five cpc votes. and the select board would be liaisons and they'd be five voting members. Yeah. And you're looking for a Madam Chair for the board to make these appointments? I'm just looking at that to me from a facilitating standpoint. The administration can do it more quickly, not based on the time schedule, the meeting schedule, or anything else. And if they have associate members, uh, they can just be elevated and can be reported to us. But uh, that's why well, the genesis of my comments earlier, you know, earlier meeting was we could, someone within the administration is going to be heading this up, um, doing the recruiting, and uh, facilitating the discussion and the action plan. Why let our meetings be an impediment to it? Let them handle it and take their recommendations. Mr. Gilberto. So I think based on the description of the general representation of somebody representing a category, not necessarily being from a committee or being a staff, but I think we can make that work, you know, from my end. If that's the board's preference. I think that makes sense. But yeah, I'm fine either way. I, to, yeah. But to me, it's, you know, we're, we're, it's almost easier to read. For, for the administration to recruit than for us to recruit, even though they're doing it for us and we're putting out the, the notices and you know, let us know if you want to volunteer and then as liaisons we're getting these little notices and things like that. Just keep it moving. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, yeah, it gets dragged down. Because people like me, they tend to procrastinate on things. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm an impediment sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, no don't make that. me liaison. That's all, just don't make me the liaison. <laughs> if it's up to me, I already know the liaison. I um, I think it should just stay with us. Okay, I'm fine. I, 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 do, I, do. Way, I think it should just stay as it is with us. And uh, certainly we would want to have some input from our director and our TA or the other boards and commissions that want to have a member serving on it that we have reciprocity with because they're already in the fight doing the work, doing the volunteering, handling the issues, you know. But I think we are, we typically do appoint these, so I think it should just stay with us. And we just, we're, that was gonna be my one of my <coughs> board member announcements was we're coming up on renewal season and reappointment season and appointment season. But anyway, that's the net, not this topic. Let's just keep it with us and see how it works out. Fine either way. But. Just so we move it. Let's get this moving. No okay. pun intended. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's get the bus rolling here. <laughs> There'll be no buses. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to establish a transportation committee happens. as outlined by the attached document. And I'll put them on second. So that, as amended by. As amended. As amended. As amended yeah. uh, just as a minute. As a minute. Yeah, I'll second. Motion by Mr. Walner, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you for this. Thank next, you next <laughs> order of business is the is the Energy Conservation Committee discuss reestablishing the committee. Thank you. Good Thanks, night. And then there's one. <laughs> <laughs> we love All right. having somebody here. I so know. we're not talking to ourselves. <laughs> okay, so we have a draft in our first draft in our um, packet of a proposal to reinvent and revive the current Energy Conservation Committee. Who's Isn't sitting on that? 122. Yeah. No, I mean, how many committee members? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Who's volunteering for that one? Well, we're not. We're just trying to review. Okay. All right. Any discussion on that? Last call. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this hasn't been meeting. I mean, that I know. It's had. It's had. It's been dormant. It's forever. been dormant. Yeah. Eight years at least. Okay, Maybe so that's ten. good because I haven't been going to the meetings. <laughs> this would be a, this would be starting from the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Establishing it basically. Yeah. All right. Okay. Any any other comments? It's just it's just you're Let's get it going. It's, it's get basically it going. there's there's money out there for us if you look on the second yes. page. You know, if it, it it sounds like when they present it to us a very reasonable, they they appear to be reasonable to work with. You know, people are in other towns, you know, it's not huge money, but they're getting some money over the years. And you just have to make reasonable efforts to try to make your town facilities and everything more energy efficient. Uh, all that. so that's the biggest attractive feature. That's that DOER um, thing. Uh, many towns have already done it, 280 out of 351 towns. So again, we're not leading the way, but we can certainly jump on board with what's going on. Um, so that would be one of the major objectives is just to organize that, just to have a place for these kind of efforts to land, for them to find it, to find the opportunities. Um, the second one is like RMLD, they'd like to work with us to do the uh, DB chargers. There's right. no one to even contact where to do that. Um, so we haven't given them a landing place to be able to come to us and get that done. Mm -hmm. So that would be something we could do. And then the future bylaws, we should be thinking of like when we do like, you know, the poultry property or something like that. We should actually be saying, just like we say, we need to have 10% affordable housing. We also need to have some EV charge there, so that's the future. And right now we haven't done that, so that should hit you know, some of our uh, CPC policies and things that we ask people to do when they come in town. This would be a good place for us to work out those kind of issues. So um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's a good opportunity for us to do it. Okay. 
Do we have a, a vote on that, or just uh, with just, just this was the first time we've had a chance to think about yeah. this. This is kind of more concept that we could before. getting it up and running again and yeah. soliciting volunteers for that. Well, just uh, if I mean we didn't do a vote, but I mean if this is good the way it is, we can certainly go with it. And then the stakeholders are down below. You know, the justice stakeholders are down below. Mm -hmm. We can modify. I mean, if we want to get it going right away, we can. I, I have. I don't know if this would change much from what it is right now. Um, so did a nice we, job of taking the transportation proposal right. concept we've done before and she put it into good words. You know, maybe somebody would want to take this to the next level and, you know, put it into good words. But whatever the board thinks about that. The important thing is that we go with the news. That's the important thing. And, and right now, Leanne's, you know, the lead is on the so she would have the primary responsibility for this. I definitely think. Uh, our building commissioner could be play a role in this, but I'm cautious to identify our employees and directors or officials on these committees because they're, you know, they need some downtime too. And mm -hmm. these are not always, you know, these are some night meetings and other types of things. I can understand that they they want their inputs, but I, I would think the building commissioner is kind of a, a key one for these types of um, focuses, I guess well, you could say. We've got, we've got the building commissioner inspector, but we also have someone in charge of our buildings. The building superintendent. Building right. superintendent, yeah. I think, would be the first place to start. This isn't just for us, though. This is no, just I understand. No, it, yeah. I, I, I think this whole charger facilities. thing, this whole electric charger, vehicle charging system thing, that you get, I think the town should get into business, but quite, quite frankly, it, it's that uh, taking more initiative to, to take advantage of these things and take some control of it. Yeah. And maybe even get some revenue out of it. But that's for future discussion. Yeah. With a group like this. Yeah. Uh, but we should at least start with our own buildings and then what we can do as a community to also assist. Okay. This forward. Okay. So do we want to more for formalize this in terms of what is the current makeup? I know it's dormant, but do you have any information about what the what the makeup of the committee is? Um I, I don't, but my recollection when I saw a, a charge for it going back a number of years was that it was si a similar membership with some citizen involvement as well. So folks representing school facilities, representing municipal facilities, and then also, you know, the public at large sort of helping out. Is there is there a reason why it's to be determined, though, if it's just a dormant committee, there must be all... Can you find out for us from the city, the town clerk? I can, yeah. I'm sure that there's a, right. the it last appointments. Pretty, when we dug in, it was pretty vague. It was an ad hoc committee mm -hmm. put together for a very specific purpose, and then it kind of was run away. What was that purpose? I think what it was, was part it? of the school design, right? Well, really but no, it was also predated that, I think. Yeah. yeah. Town, like lights and everything? Lights. lights. And, oh, okay. Well, mostly lights is what happened. A lot of the ballots, not in this room, but in other rooms. Right. That was a big, a big thing that was success successful. I mean, there was a lot that took place. When they converted to LED? Um, to compact fluorescent for the most part, but yes. Oh, okay. okay, so. Yeah, I'm so, so what we what technology we moved to is now obsolete. We should be moving forward <laughs> to something else. All right. So, uh, it, was, <laughs> it was a big undertaking, and it was a yeah. very successful program because it evolved. And then it was completed, and it just went dormant and didn't move along with the times. This is definitely behind if we don't we don't have this. It's really behind. I mean, but okay, so that's. And I so think there would be high interest from the town. Actually, a lot of people really want to get out. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'd be surprised yeah. if we don't get a lot of people. Right. Who want right. To use. Okay. So are we? What would our next step be, Mister? Yeah, it takes an investment in buying these. I think we have some money hanging around to do it. One we'll time expenditure money for oh from the. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So Which we have to spend by 2020. Well, I know, but I mean, th these spend. types of initiatives certainly fall into, I believe, the category mm -hmm. that, you know, non recurring expenses that you want to have a long lasting positive effect on things. So, 
All right. So do we need a vote? There, there should be a vote and whether oh, we're ready to do that here? tonight. No. There, there isn't a motion. I wasn't sure no. whether we were going to no. be at that point. But yeah. There's, there, no, motion. there's no motion. Not for tonight, but if the board okay. is ready to take action, then I think it's ready. Do we have a motion to take action? <laughs> <laughs> and revive and revive and appoint to this? It shouldn't be an ad hoc, though. It should really just be a regular committee. Yeah, that's... yeah, it should be. This should be like a forever committee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything like, changes constantly. Yeah, this is, this is so many. There's there's there so many things that fall under this energy conservation yeah. umbrella yeah. that it's not going well. No, no. Who, whose oversight do you want it to see it fall under, other than not yours? <laughs> I mean, where, where would the appropriate place be? I think if it's focused on municipal and school facilities, it probably would need to come out of the Department of Public Works. Um, but I will tell you that I'm concerned about the capacity there right now. I don't disagree. You know, so yeah. um, there isn't a great... No, but if you have your superintendent of buildings potentially being the, the focal point initially to... I think that I think he could certainly assist uh, and, with it, um, but I, I will tell you... And maybe partner with the facility person over at uh, the school department to coordinate the effort and again focus on the municipal portion first municipal buildings first and as that evolves into other things we can do within the community great okay so anyway but I, it's, I, I, uh, I, I, I turn to it but I don't disagree the Department of Public Works director is out of time yeah. you know Yes. He's, he's, been, he's got an awful lot on his yeah, plate right, right now. And I, I also concerned for the building superintendent who's got a backlog of capital projects he's trying so, to cap uh, catch up on. And since it's a committee, it's a select board committee, right? I think that's how it's proposed, right? So why don't, <laughs> but it, 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 why don't we let Mr. Walner get it organized for us? <laughs> I mean, not that he's not already. Yeah, but I, well, this is Leon, so I mean, this is Leon. <laughs> She's a liaison for us, so let's be, you know. Leanne probably has a hundred people that you could think of that would want to serve on that. I'd certainly be happy to help. Maybe, maybe if we, Madam Chair, through you, if yes. we could maybe get the committee going, I can talk to staff let's about Let's get what the sense. committee going and talk Sorry. to I'll tell you Gonzalez. what, why don't, why don't, why don't Mr. Let's Walden, go. Mr. Gonzalez, speak to the yeah. town administrator, come back with a proposal for the board at the next meeting, you know, right. two meetings from now or something, right. just to, you know, get what's going to what's going to work? Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. So no yeah. motion yet, but other than mm -hmm. you, you're ready for that. Are you ready for that, Mrs. Gonzalez? Yes. Right. Yes. That's gonna yes, be, Madam Chair. That's going to be that's going to probably generate a lot of interest because people are really focused in on energy conservation right now. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Next order business is a memorandum of agreement, DPW Teamsters Local 25, and we have a vote to ratify? Yep. Do we Madam have a motion? Yep. Madam Chair, I move to ratify and sign the memorandum of agreement between the Town of North Reading and the DPW Teamsters Local 25 for the term effective July 1, 2021 to June 30, 2024. Yeah. Second. No. Motion by Mr. Walker. I did the other one. We'll Second by Mr. Studo. Yep. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's a good opportunity for us to thank our DPW workforce yes. um, for Absolutely. all the things and all the all the all the things they already do for the town, but all the extra things they jumped in to help out and do for the town. So, yes. especially during our trash Including situation, they correct. were right there. They were fantastic. Right, and Didn't they this every time you do, we do call them on things. They get right on top of it for the town. So they're very yeah. responsive and they mobilize right away. This is an example, and I don't know if anyone was with me, but this morning um, they were tending to a clogged culvert. It was in the high twenties. They're in a kayak, in a kayak, trying to deal with the issue. I mean, that's this is wow. what, what our guys do. You know, yeah. So it's we're very fortunate. It's great. Okay. Next order of business. We're gonna do the minutes. 
Yeah, legal bills. And I think we can um, legal bills. No, someone. I, I think my colleague asked me to skip over those legal bills. Please. Okay. Do we have a motion on the legal? Bill? <laughs> yes. Um, Madam Chair, I move to approve payment of invoice one one four two seven dated November seventeenth, twenty twenty two, for Furman Gregory the Tupla the Tula in the amount of twenty four two thousand eight hundred eleven dollars. Second. Motion by Mr. Walner, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in. I'll, I'll just say that I actually did do my homework and went through all the bills. And as far as I can tell, they did what they were supposed to do. And, um, you know, let's stay and be done with it. Yeah, let's just be done with it. That's it. I also feeling. went through it all, and this is the end of it. Maybe to see. Yeah, I, Mr. Madam, Gilberto, so maybe you'll just bring us all up to date. Madam Where Chair, I think everybody knows I'm, you know, we're limited as to our comment with regard to the litigation, but we um, we have received the required payments uh, by both parties. Um, and we are in the process of making uh, the one of the two payments due from the town to um, the, the other side. Uh, it'll be on the warrant this week. Um, the final payment will come at some other point later in time. So everybody's doing what they're supposed to do in terms of the process, which is really good for everybody involved. Are and we, have we done the close out to get that a, funding returned to us we have that a, this took years to We have close a meeting out. scheduled for next Tuesday with the MSBA and I give them a lot of credit for making sure that they sort of quarterback getting things going. And uh, both both parties have been very responsive with trying to get to that meeting. So um, I'm optimistic that things will move pretty quickly after that happens. So And is this it with up to it, that is my understanding from uh, uh, the, his own, the only remaining action will be to notify the court and um, if that hasn't happened already it may have already happened but my understanding from him is that that would be it and when you reviewed the bill did he bill us for that notification he did not bill it for all up communication. so we're, we're probably going to get another bill after this. no he told me he wouldn't bill it wouldn't bill us see some pro bono work we've heard that before <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we have a motion by Mr. Walner, a second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, there's a few in here. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve payment of invoice 6340094, dated 9-22-2022, from Jams Incorporated in the amount of $6,111.96. Second. Motion by Mr. Walner. Did you get your Christmas card from the judge yet? Second. Let you. <laughs> <laughs> Second, I, I need to send him a Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Motion by Mr. Walner. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any any other ones? Um, so now we're on to uh, minutes. minutes. Um, and we have several minutes. Do do my is it is it okay with my colleagues if we just if there's I Why believe the amendments have been made in the drop box that Mrs. McNeil left us. May we just take a vote to approve all of the minutes and just one omnibus motion instead yeah, of one at a time? Yeah, yeah, read all the dates read all, read all, all at once. Okay. Right? All right. So here I go. Hang on. Madam Chair, I move to approve the July 12, 2021 regular session minutes. July 12, 2021, executive session minutes. Um, August 16, 2021, regular session minutes. August 16, 2021, executive session minutes. September 8, 2021, regular session minutes. September 8, 2021, executive session minutes. September 20, regular session minutes. September 2021, executive session minutes. October 4, 2021, regular session minutes. October 4, 2021, executive session minutes. November 22nd, 2021, regular session minutes. And finally, November 22nd, 2021, executive session minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Walner, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Next, <laughs> next order of business. Town Administrator's Report. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, through you, uh, four items to report this evening. First is that I included a report from the Police Department regarding the 
speed of vehicles on Lakeside Boulevard. Um, the information has been forwarded to the Department of Public Works for further review with the traffic engineers. So we continue to look at the information relative to um, the situation on Lakeside Boulevard. Uh, but, uh, the first step of gathering some speed data has occurred, and we will be digesting that and looking further at that with some engineering help. The second is that the DPW director and I will be working to amend the agreement with JRM for trash and recycling collection to reflect the assumption of the obligation by Republic, which is now taken over, um, as well as a five-day collection schedule, uh, and to secure a credit for the cost incurred as a result of the delayed and missed collections in October. Um, initial responses that we received from other vendors indicate that um, continuing discussions with Republic is more favorable financially for the town. And that's not a surprise based on the very initial feedback we got back in October. Um, and we do continue to see much more reliable performance from Republic over the past few weeks. Um, but there is some negotiation to occur, and we will be doing that uh, in the coming weeks as well to keep the community apprised. Relatedly, um, the Pay As You Throw uh, program um, is uh, coming up and running. Um, right now, um, the, just to remind folks, the requirement is that for trash in excess of two 50-gallon barrels, um, a Pay As You Throw bag must be used. The bags may be purchased from Christopher's, from Ryers, from CVS, from Moynihan Lumber and from Reading Lumber right now. And we're working to get them into stop and shop, but there's a more formal approval process that we're in the middle of still. Um, it continues to be a soft rollout, and by that I mean um, we've been collecting but um, begun the process of uh, trying to warn folks with a sticker that would go on their barrel. Um, we're trying not to, there was a lot of disruption that happened in October, and we recognize that, yeah. and we're trying to roll this in. Um, as um, reasonably as we can, but we are not leaving trash curbside right now, and, and they're not planning to um, for at least probably another week or so. Um, but there is a requirement to put that trash in a pay as you throw bag, and we're asking folks to do that. Um, and uh, we'll be looked at, looking at that um, um, more so um, as we move along in the December. And the final item I'll just note is uh, as we, um, over the library, and we have a, a staffing plan that the library directors identified, which would allow for us to uh, better take advantage of funding and hours and to take what is effectively a single full-time position and create two part-time positions, um, which I think uh, is really good in trying to advance the cause uh, for the library over there. It makes good use of existing uh, resources. So there will be a couple of postings. I encourage folks who are interested in working over the library to take a look on the town website um, in uh, the course of the next um, few weeks. Um, and you know, certainly send us your letter of interest and resume if you're interested. Um, and that concludes my comments for this evening. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Gilfardo? Good. Ms. Mr. Gonzalez and then Mr. O'Leary. Has anybody purchased a page you throw bag yet? Has they anybody? Not, some folks have, yes. They're, they're, not, they're not purchasing them from us. They're being purchased from right. the stores, but there are folks who are purchasing them. I will tell you, I have not yet. I intended to and have not yet, but uh, <laughs> there are folks that are buying them. Um, you know, um, I will tell you one obstacle to the stir enforcement is that JRM is still in the process, excuse me, Republic is in the process of securing the stickers that we need to warn people. So um, that, that's also not working in our favor. We're just trying to get people in the habit of using the bag first. That's really what we're trying to, to do moving forward. And again, we have increased that barrel limit from 235 gallons right. to 250 gallon limit. So you are able to put more trash curbside before you need to rely on a bag. Great. Thank you. Mr. O'Leary? Uh, just in relation to the your neighborhood, Lakeside yeah. Boulevard um, traffic study. Uh, will that information, or has it already been shared with uh, Mr. Parent? I, I believe that it, it has Mr. been. Mr. Parent and any other residents have been someone else who corresponded through Representative Jones' office. Um, we're, so we're in the process of disseminating, and I believe that uh, that the, the the primary inquiring resident uh, was going to be updated today. Right. With regard. Okay. So we are. I just think it's important. And again, I, I want to you know, acknowledge uh, the quick action by the police department in moving forward with the traffic study, uh, taking the necessary steps to determine whether or not it would qualify for any type of traffic calming uh, measures if possible, and uh, going through the appropriate steps that we have to go through in order to, to address the situation. So uh, we'd be congratulated, along in conjunction with the DPW, uh, working with them too. So, uh, but I just think it's important to communicate with the people who reached out to us. You know, mm -hmm. We can announce it here, but we should you know, just reach out to those few people that that corresponded with us and let them know that it's available. Here are the fibers. The, I know the intention was to reach out to the resident today. So. Right. Is there an update on, was it a little girl who was 
Is there yeah. any upgrade? Is she? It's my my neighbor right now. She, she's in her house. Is she okay? She's actually doing really good. Oh. Yeah, I haven't seen the gash in the head yet, but um, you know, she's doing quite a job. Oh, it's amazing how little kids can bounce back yeah. so fast. Yeah, thank God. It's really a serious situation. I was there when it happened. Oh, so you I was like a minute or two behind the actual wow. accident. So. And the neighbors see the speed monitor, they're very happy. I mean, informally, they're very happy about that. So, you know, uh, Sergeant, Sergeant Howe? Yes. Yeah. You know, he's taking good action to look at this. You know, you have to be fair with everything that's going on, but it appears he's taking good action. And um, so the neighborhood's pleased to see that that came up. And, you know, so we're happy to see that. Good. Hopefully, that happens again. All right. Thank you. Because it was. Really tough. Yeah. It's really hard. Yeah. What's the speed limit there? 30. 30. And the person was way over that? Uh, apparently, no. Speed no, was speed. not determined to be a factor in the accident. Yeah. So 30 is just a little too fast for that road? Um, or it's I'm not conclusive. Of this yeah, the, the data would indicate that the speeds uh, for a lot of folks is actually less than that. So um, th there's a bit to digest with regard to the. The results of the, of the speed end of it. It, was, it. it wasn't a full traffic study. It was a, to begin with the yeah. covert radar speed um, gathering exercise. And so now we need to take that information and try to move to the next step. I mean, I most say of those roads over there, they're pretty narrow, aren't they? Right. right. And windy. It's, it, there's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a few stretches. And this is one of the stretches that where you, you can, can, can accelerate. You can accelerate. Okay. It's actually, um, you know, there's the uh, the Lost Colony, you know, the Endor, the Lost Colony, in there, which yeah. they, you know, have a, they're trying to race around right. to get out. So it's a little different, a um, little different. Uh, um, yeah. I, I guess it seems just a little different approach. But it takes a lot because we're still we studied intersections and we had calming measures and things that we were supposed to be doing and I don't I still don't think they're done on some of them you know the um, some of the roadways here so it seems like you can study and they can do the traffic studies but it takes it's like moving mountains to get because there's some really dangerous intersections that yeah. accidents happen at regularly where kids are crossing and cyclists and pedestrians and there's did nothing changes on that right. yeah. some places that just need a light you know they simply need a traffic stop stoplight there is a um i'll just mention it uh because it came to my attention from all this is like up in andover they're considering a default 25 mile per hour speed limit unless it's marked otherwise and apparently in massachusetts there's 60 communities out of the 350 that actually have adopted that as a standard. So it's, it's a big change for a town to consider, but it's something, you know, um, people tend to go fast on the, some of the back streets here, and, you know, it's a, it's a thought to consider. And I'm sure that the police department thinks that could, you know, safety thinks that's an important thing we should think about it. But it isn't, again, we're not leading the path. There's a lot of towns that have already adopted that as a you know, standard for a town that's 25 miles an hour unless it's marked otherwise. Right now it's 30. Right now it's 30 right in this section. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know what they do on Central Street over those hills. And we know. Yeah. It's um, Park Street. It's not 30. <laughs> on Park Street. Yeah. On that note, on the, the two intersections that got approved to be done, is anything happening on those? There so were four, and we. The finance committee approved two, correct? I believe the construction funding was for the one at Haverhill and Just the one? Chestnut. So there's a design that's underway for that intersection. I will tell you, I have pretty regular conversation with the Department of Public Works about the other two intersections. There was some striping that was done at Central Street and, uh, and Park Street, um, at least to try to guide folks who are making that right turn from yeah. Central South onto Park Street headed eastbound. Um, I don't know how much attention it's actually getting with yeah. people. I see tire tracks go right over it. Right. Um, so that's been a challenge. There was some updated signage that was done at, at, uh, at those intersections as well. But, you know, one thing that we have tried to look at outside of the capital project is what can we do at Central and North, and particularly yes. coming down the hill on North, other than changing the grade of the hill. 
obviously. Um, and um, some ideas we've been talking about internally that might be a little more straightforward and were identified in that first study, some sort of a warning um, kind of near the nursing home at that spot. That yeah. that gets stuff. So that's something that we're looking into. I will tell you, we've been a bit frustrated by the fact that we have a vacancy in the engineering department right now. So right. Um, we have an engineering firm that's focused on one project. We kind of have a smaller project that's also very important that we want them to work on, but no one to really oversee it with them right now. Okay. Which, by the way, I'm hoping to be able to resolve in the next week, and hopefully we'll have an engineer right. that will keep that moving. Um, but in terms of the big funding right now, it's the Haverhill and Chestnut intersection that's been receiving the attention because of the town meeting appropriation. But didn't, didn't Brad Jones come through with some money for the other intersections? I thought they did. Um, no, am I wrong about that? I, I'm, I'm not, it's not coming to mind. I'm, I'm thinking oh. of the, the Haverhill and Chestnut, but I could be. There may be, you know, I know what I, I take that there back. was funding for the kids' spot. There was some money. Yeah, yeah. Kids spot. I thought there was also some to, to the end. I I'll go back money. and look. There's been like 12 different items that have gotten funded okay. at different points. I'll go I, back I and look. I thought I remember seeing that because I thought they were going to do more yeah. because of the funding they got from Brad Jones. And I'll have to go back and check. There was there were a number of projects that were approved in the summertime, and then the funding never actually materialized because the bill didn't get signed into law. Okay. And then some of those projects came back again just a few weeks ago. I don't remember that being one of them, but I will check. Yeah, you probably would like to know that. Okay, any other questions? All right, for Olden board members and Olden and Mr. O'Leary. Uh, wastewater subcommittee is meeting again tomorrow, so uh, again, we're going to be determining, you know, how we're going to be moving forward and how we're going to be looking at the financing of it again. The project cost is what it is. It's just a question of how we allocate the um, the funding for it to whom. So we're going to be working on that and we'll report back as soon as we have any progress to be made. Um, again, just the Board of Health continues to meet on a regular basis too. And again, as we're talking about, you know, everybody's getting pretty comfortable with things, but the numbers are keep going up again. And, uh, and just everybody be cognizant again, particularly over the holidays here and as people start to travel and all the rest. It's, uh, it's not just COVID now, it's the flu and RSV and a few other things going on. And Board of Health again continues to monitor and, and meet and also uh, sponsor clinics and participate in clinics and that's all available on the website. And just uh, urge people to you know, visit the website and uh, if you want to get tested or you want to get vaccinated, it's all available. Uh, you're encouraged to do so. Um, just a more old new business type thing. Since our last meeting, the election took place. So I want to acknowledge the efforts that were put in by our local election officials here, the clerk, the election workers uh, worked well, the early voting, the mail-in voting, um, pretty much without a glitch. And, um, participation level was pretty good, Very good. High, which was great. And uh, I think the, the end results and the messages were fairly clear. People just want some normalcy restored back to uh, our political lives and some, uh, I think, elected officials. I mean, we do a pretty good job here, but at, at other levels, um, keep the extreme and extremism to a minimum, and just get the people's business done. And stop the nonsense. So, but and again, to, to the clerk and the election workers and everybody else that pulled it all off again over a several week time period, uh, to be congratulated and appreciated. Uh, again. Leanne and I were at the uh, Thanksgiving dinner, uh, sponsored by Representative Jones and uh, Senator Tarr and Linda Jones, who pulls it all together. Uh, mm -hmm. We were back inside a building, That's thank great. goodness, because it was gale force winds outside. If we were back outside <laughs> handing out bags, I can't imagine how that would have worked. I was being very thankful yes, that we were so, yeah, we, 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 we were thankful. We were thankful about a lot of things, but it, it was, it's wonderful <laughs> to be back in, uh, and we were back into the Hillview facility. And again, to uh, Adelson and Fabiano, the yeah. ultra sheep people who are now the uh, the operators of the facility, they did a fantastic job uh, pulling it all off. And uh, thinking it was just a good reminder, of the sense of community that we have, the type of community we have, and if we have events such as this to to gather together as a community, uh, setting all of our political differences aside, and just being great for what we have here. As evidence. You know, tonight, tonight by our various different town employees and department heads that were here tonight, you know, constantly working beyond normal working hours, seven days a week. Uh, we just signed a contract with the DPW. Uh, 
uh, I know that we're all grateful and thankful for all that they do for us, and uh, just want to ensure that uh, everybody has a safe and happy and healthy uh, Thanksgiving and travel safely, because everybody's going to be on the road, I guess. And traffic's unbelievable, and air traffic too. So again, uh, grateful for our community, grateful for my colleagues and their service, and the administration and all the employees, and uh, enjoy your holiday. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, just two things. One is um, the, the Commission on Disabilities. Uh, we're actually working with Bill, and we brought in somebody from BU who's in the social work area. Um, we're working on a survey. We hope to get out to the town to look at um, transportation. Part of it is going to be about transportation for the five demographics, similar to what you saw before. It's going to be addressing the needs of the disabled in town and try to really get, uh, get, a, get a handle on that if we haven't done. So that group is, from start, you know, has really put a lot together. We've got some great resources, and uh, we'll be doing, hopefully, in the first quarter of next year, we'll have that survey out and get some really good information. It'll help launch transportation committee. It'll help the commission on disability do its work. It'll feed to the vet services. It'll feed to all the different departments that deal with these kind of types of communities. Um, so that's that's on a fast track. And the other one is I went to the CPC meeting. Uh, the, the other night, um, Jerry Noel was there. The big thing out there, the reason why I went and why Jerry was there was because we work on the accessory dwelling unit policy that we've been asking for. Um, Jerry had reviewed it. He thought it was great. Daniel had done a really nice job of writing it up. It's got legal verbiage and everything else like that. Um, I had questions which were largely shot down, but that doesn't matter. Um, there were good questions, anyways. Um, but the if you do say so yourself, <laughs> what's that again? If you do say so yourself, yeah, I were very good questions. <laughs> they were good questions. I got a little support from the audience after actually <laughs> asking questions that got shut down. But it doesn't matter. The important thing is the accessory dwelling unit policy will come to our attention. They'll be bringing it to us for like a workshop so we can review it as well. But the important thing is for our town is to be able to allow caretakers and or family members to live in the, in the houses and help the people stay in the homes and do it with the blessing of the town is really an important thing to keep people in homes. And so Sounds this great. is this is the most practical thing we can do right now to help people out. Um, so I'm really excited about it coming forward to us, hopefully sooner than later. So. so it's coming to us as a zoning change. Zoning amendment. Yes. Yes. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But well done and well reviewed and uh, so uh, looks good. Okay, thank you, Mr. Long. Mrs. Gonzalez. Uh, so we had our Veterans Day um, at the Common, and we proclaimed the town as a Purple Heart community. It was a beautiful day, um, and everything went great. Um, and then we also had our Veterans Dinner. That was really, really nice. It's, it's just such a great event at the Tipsbury Country Club, which will be the last year that we have it there. It's been sold, um, so I think the plans are to move it back home, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully at the Hillview next year. That would be really great. Um, just just a, a, a great event that uh, our veteran director works very hard on, and her new assistant and the Veterans Events Committee, and it all comes together beautiful. It's just a really nice night. Um, the Thanksgiving event was great. It was great to be back in the Hillview. Um, and they're doing a great job over there. They're just really doing a fantastic job over there. It's nice to see it back in business. Um, this Sunday, there are two events. There's a uh, the Reading North Reading. Um, my mind is true. Chamber. Chamber of Commerce, thank you, <laughs> um, is having the tree lighting at the Common. And also, the Moose is having their Festival of Trees, which is a great thing to go to, too, also. So those two events are going on this Sunday, if everybody wants to get out and um, get a little Christmas spirit. I think the tree lighting is at 2 on the Common. You know, I, I don't have my phone with me, so I don't have those up. 2.30 to 4.30, and the tree lighting is generally around 4.30. Around 4.30, yeah. when it's getting dark. Just yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there'll be activities from 2.30 to 4.30. Okay. 
Mr. Thank you, Mr. Strudel. Happy Thanksgiving. Good. And I'll say uh, the veterans ceremony, I think, was probably the largest group of participants that we've seen in a while. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful day, yes. but there were so many people there. And even though the day wasn't about us, and it was largely about thanking veterans, but also that we, we became a Purple Heart community, uh, Senator Tarr still surprised us because he read a citation for us for implementing uh, the um, Purple Heart community. So I don't know who has that, but yeah, probably Sue has Susan it. Probably, yeah. yeah, but it was just well done and well attended, and the band was excellent, and the scouts were there to help out, and the, yeah, it was a great the police honor guard was there, and it was just very, very well done. I, I, I agree and thank Sue and her whole team for doing that and thank all the veterans that came to that. And hopefully we can keep this sort of contribution purple. One of the veterans' Purple Heart story, as told by his grandson, was read there. It was really um, just, just amazing to hear what people went through to get those Purple Hearts. And they also gave a... a an award, uh, the Liberty award, award. The Liberty Award to a family yes. from whose son passed away in, in battle years and years ago. The Korean War. So it was a really moving ceremony <clears throat> and just really well done. Always well done. Well done. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that was really nice. I want to echo my colleague, Mr. O'Leary's comment that I am very grateful to be working with all of you. All of the effort that you put in sight unseen and um, sometimes critics can come out of the woodwork and don't realize everything that's done and all the commitment and all the investment. In it. But I'm lucky enough and fortunate enough that I work with all of you and like Mr. O'Leary said, we may not always agree. We may have not some nice debate, but at the end of the day, every single person here is invested in the best interests of the town and the best interests of the citizens of the town. I'm very grateful to be here with you. I'm very thankful. Thankful to be in this town and thankful for the administration and thankful for my colleagues for your commitment. And I hope, wish everyone a peaceful Thanksgiving. Safe and peaceful Thanksgiving, too. Excuse me, Madam Chair, one other thing. The North Valley High School fall sports teams. Oh, yes. yeah. Oh, my goodness. The you football know, team, the, yeah. Well, you get the, the girls' Super. soccer, boys' soccer, well into the, the, the extra season, the divisional championships, uh, great success there. Mm. Uh, football. They go to the Super Bowl. Go on the Super Bowl. And uh, fantastic. Yeah. Track, track team made it to yeah. states. Yeah, track team made it to states. Yeah. Unbelievable. And then Some we've got, the, then we got a, uh, the kids in the performing arts that are just making a name for themselves, too. And, mm -hmm. you know, the community can be very proud of the, uh, and the, the high school, school system. Not just the school. education these kids are getting, the, the book, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but yeah. all these other extracurricular things that help form uh, the adults for uh, tomorrow. And, uh, but... Wow, what a terrific yeah. Yeah. season for them. And kudos Fantastic. to the high school band, sounded phenomenal. Oh, excellent. Yeah. excellent. And, they're, and they've got their new uniforms, yeah. they're looking good, yeah. So cute. I, have, I, I had three things I wanted to mention, and you just reminded me what the third thing was. I can't believe I forgot to do this. <laughs> At the, the high school masker's performance of Pippin is coming up the first and second week. So Friday, December 3rd and 4th, and the Friday, Ten, the next week, Friday and Saturday of the following week. Tickets are available if you go online, Maskers Weebly, you can go to the link and buy tickets. And although there are tickets available, this usually these usually sell out. They are very reasonable. It's a, an amazing production. Mrs. Kane puts on a Broadway quality yes, production. Does. I have a kid who's going to apparently be dangling in the air and all sorts of fun circus stuff, but they're, they're always loving it. 
he's having a grand old time. So it's supposed she always outdoes herself, and these kids are so invested in this and and just loving it. And it's a great group of people from the uh, the little kids that come in from the the you know the the uh, younger kids that participate to the people that run the tech crew. It's just amazing. So. So please come and come and see and enjoy the show because it's supposed to be pretty, pretty good. And that's coming up. So get your tickets quickly. All right. Oh, I forgot that. How could I have forgotten that? <laughs> All right. So um, good. Madam Chair, I propose we adjourn. Motion by Mr. Wallace, second by Mr. O'Leary. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.